Good morning to everyone. And thank you to today's speakers for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to be able to host you at URAC Research, although only in a virtual format. So maybe next time we will have the chance to meet in presence, hopefully. Uh, before I introduce our guests and today's presentation, um, allow me a couple of words to introduce ourselves, Francesco, uh, Francisco Javier Romero Caro and myself, I'm Alice Valdisalici, and especially a few words on the research project under which this workshop series has been organized and funded. Francisco and I are senior researchers at URAC Research, and in particular, we work at the Institute for Comparative Federalism, which is one out of 11 institutes at URAC. Uh, our institute carries out comparative studies and apply research on federal, regional, and local issues. And we are a team, medium-sized team of around 20 research composed of comparative constitutional lawyers and political scientists. And we look at uh, how constitutional law affects the governance of territorial pluralism. And we do so, especially through the lenses of the federal toolkit. At our institute, we frequently host research fellows and we carry on some training program among which I would like just to mention the Winter School on Federalism and, Go and Governance that takes place every year for more than 10 years now. One of the research foci of the Institute is fiscal federalism. That is uh, the cluster under which this workshop series and the project is organized. Um, again, also in this project, we adopt a comparative and constitutional law perspective and we look at fiscal constitution, we monitor the ongoing reforming processes and the, their implementation, and we have a special attention at intergovernmental institution and decision-making procedures in this specific field. Um, an interesting, um, among the most investigated topic in the last years, I would like to mention tax autonomy and fiscal responsibility. Um, we develop a method to measure fiscal responsibility from a comparative constitutional law perspective. We investigate constitutional symmetries in this field. And we also have a focus on local finance and in particular at intergovernmental relations. So relation with local government with the upper levels in the financial field. Um, equalization mechanism as a tool of conflict management are also another focus of investigation. And the date project um, works within this specific uh, field of research. In fact, DATE is the acronym that stands for diversity accommodation through territorial equalization. And it's within this project that this workshop series has been organized. What is the idea, the, the background idea uh, of this project? The, the, the assumption was that fiscal instrument have a role in accommodating diversity. And to a certain extent, they have a role also at reducing the risk of secession. And this, despite the fact that this topic, so fiscal instrument has barely been explored by the literature that explore secessionist claim and trends. So the idea of date is to go behind the current state of the art and explore from a legal point of view, the role of fiscal arrangements and in particular of equalization mechanism as a tool of territorial integration or disintegration. And this is done focusing on a federal system facing secessionist challenging. And to achieve this goal, um, the, one of the main aim of the project is to develop a set of indicators that are used as an instrument for comparative analysis and for measuring the impact of equalization mechanism on territorial integration. So this is more or less the main um, structure and focus of the, of the project. And just to mention is the fact that the project has been awarded the seal of excellence under the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship Program. And for this reason, the Autonomous Province of Bolzano has funded the project for two years. And we are now close to the end. So um, the project will end at the end of September. And so this is a kind of 
uh, final conference in order to expand the case studies of analysis because main focus of the project is Scotland, um, Quebec, and Catalonia, but we wanted to have an additional extra perspective on the topic. So diversity accommodation through territorial equalization. So I think that now it's start and time, sorry, it's time to start <laughs> with the present with today's presentation. And uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor David Bell, who will give a presentation with the title, The Effects of Brexit on Fiscal Federalism in the UK. Professor Bell uh, is professor of economics at the University of Stirling since um, 1990, and he's specialized in labor economics and fiscal federalism. He has been advisor to the finance committee of the Scottish parliament and also consultant to many other international organizations like ILO, OECD, um, and also consultant to the Westminster and Irish government. Um, among other things, I would like to mention that he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He has published extensively on this topic and so we are really um, willing and we are really looking forward to hearing his presentation on this topic. So the, Professor David Bell, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for, for that kind introduction and apologies for, for having to move my presentation um, to uh, today rather than tomorrow. Um, which is due actually to meeting some of these uh, politicians who are concerned about the current state of affairs within the UK. So I, yeah, I've got a I've got a sort of medium length uh, presentation to try to explain the effects of uh, Brexit or the effects that Brexit has had on the. Um, uh, <laughs> secessionist tendencies to some extent it, it's a little it, 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 it's not clear that it has shifted the the overall balance um, of uh, sentiment towards independence for example in Scotland uh, a, at the economic level but there have been considerable changes that have affected the interrelationships between the Scottish Welsh Northern Irish authorities and the UK government, which uh, uh, as yet have not been manifest in terms of actual um, policies that uh, individuals uh, see on the ground, but nevertheless, there, there is considerable potential for that to happen. So um, let me share my screen. How does that go? Is that all right? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, this presentation uh, reflects to a considerable extent, but not completely, a uh, journal article that will, we hope, be published towards the end of the year in the National Institute Economic Review uh, in London. And uh, it also covers a bit of uh, uh, the effects of COVID and how what effects that that had on fiscal federalism. I'll just take a, a very short detour into COVID um, to explain some some features of the way that uh, that um, fiscal federalism has been developing in the UK. But but I'm going to concentrate mainly on Brexit. So um, let me. Uh, move on to the next screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so my um, contention for this talk is that the political economy of, of Brexit has substantially undermined the cohesion of UK internal economic frameworks. And a lot of that has had to do with the necessary uh, adjustments that have been made internally within the UK as, the as a result of the powers that, that uh, the UK government uh, uh, took back from Brussels 
once Brexit happened, it I, it was well, it was clear to me that there was no coherent plan for how, how this was to be dealt with. So a lot of it has been dealt with sort of um, in uh, in haste uh, and without uh, much consultation. Uh, but my view is that it, that it has substantially undermined the cohesion in perhaps ways that 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 you are not yet aware of. Um, Clearly, on a political level, uh, both Scotland and Northern Ireland voted against Brexit, but these views have been completely ignored in pretty much everything that I'm going to be talking about today, and indeed in, in the common discourse that the, the views that Scotland and, and uh, Northern Ireland took have been largely ignored. So. Uh, I was interested in the introduction, talking a lot about um, constitutional arrangements. And of course, I guess you're pretty well aware that the UK does not have a written constitution. And uh, there's a, a famous um, political scientist, or is he a historian, Hennessy at Oxford, who, who uh, describes the, Brit the way the British system works as the good chap theory of government in other words, it will keep going so long as the people in government are of a reasonably sensible uh, uh, disposition and don't have uh, incentives to create schisms uh, or, or, or uh, motivations to do so. And um, we're not in a, a, that that way of running the government is is increasingly under question and particularly so in the last few months, as you will have seen in the news, um, in relation to our present prime minister, whose fate now hangs in the balance. I think that that's the best way to describe it. One of the things which um, uh, is effectively true, irrespective of our current problems, is that one parliament can't commit future parliaments under our system of government. And therefore, you you end. It is quite possible to end up with um, uh, quite wide swings of policy, uh, and and that's further exacerbated by our voting system, which is first past the post, which which um, doesn't encourage small centrist parties at all. So the the Liberal Democrats would be our small centrist party, but it has very little chance, although its chances may be improving quite almost exponentially as we speak, but, but in, in, in the past few decades has, has not had a massive influence on the way that um, UK government has, uh, has conducted itself, whether it be off the left or the right. So I'm sure you, many of you will be aware of this, but but it is worth going over this again, I think. So I'll, I'll refer a lot to devolved governments. Um, sometimes they're called devolved authorities, but I'll, I'll use the, the uh, uh, shortened form DGs because I'm, uh, in order to save some space on my PowerPoint slides rather than write devolved governments all the time. Um, and the way that they've um, been funded, so I'm talking about Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, these three nations, whether Northern Ireland is a nation is, is a bit debatable, but, but I'll, 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 I'll leave that aside. Um, they, they are largely funded through, through something called the Barnett Formula, which was inter introduced as a temporary measure uh, in 1979, but persists. It has persisted all this time because no one can think of anything better that commands um, significant cross-party support uh, and that would last longer than a parliament, following what I said earlier on. And the way that it works is, uh, and I'll show this again on the next slide, is that uh, if there are uh, uh, decisions made by the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer to increase the sp in spending in England on what's called a comparable 
program that's that's really important and i'll i'll, I'll come back to that um the uh, devolved governments receive their population share of whatever whatever increase uh is agreed for england so the the devolved uh, nations themselves account for about 15% of the total population of the UK. Therefore, if there is a hundred million increase in, say, health spending, then an additional what's called a, a Barnet consequential of 15 billion would be paid to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. This mechanism does not um, take account of any objective assessment of need. Indeed, one might argue that the only objective assessment of need that governed the allocation of spending within the UK was when the EU allocated the structural funds on the basis of GDP per head. Um, there is no such calculation uh, for the allocations to the devolved governments. It is argued, and I, I won't go into the historical roots of this, that this, although I'll, I'll point out what it actually means, that this has led to overfunding of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So they get them uh, being given more resources than they need, depending on how one, one uh, defines need. Um, that's, so that's been the system since 1979, but threats to um secession threats effectively have led to considerable transfer of fiscal powers um over the last eight years following on from the referendum for scottish independence in 2014 there have been a, a number of uh taxes that have been devolved to uh scotland the principal one is income tax but a lot of all the property taxes and also some welfare payments are now administered by uh, and and funded by the Scottish government. In all of this and com compared with other uh, well with, and compared with federal states, the uh, amount of borrowing that the devolved governments can do is extremely limited uh, um, to a few hundred of a few hundred millions of pounds um and the treasury the which which is the body which uh, operates the barnet formula has always been protected its uh, its right to control borrowing and and effectively uh negated any right that the the um devolved governments or, or, or minimized the amount of borrowing carried out by the devolved governments. So um, the one consequence of this um, uh, is that, well, not a consequence, the, the, the Treasury controls the um, way that the Barnett formula operates. So there is no law which specifies how the Barnett formula should be arranged. Uh, if the Treasury decides to change the rules, it can do so unilaterally. It doesn't need to um, ask the, any permission from the devolved governments to change those arrangements. And indeed it does. It does so partly by changing what it defines as comparable. It, it is the sole judge of what is comparable spending uh, and and the um, uh, devolved governments have no right to to uh, contest that case. I'll give you an example: was the Olympics. It was argued that the Olympics was effectively uh, spending in England, and there was no reason for any comparable spending in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The, the, it was a one-off, admittedly, uh, but the um, Treasury refused to allow any comparable spending on, on in, in the devolved territories uh, following on from spending on the Olympics. More well, that's, that's important in its own right, but they're also a thing which is really not understood by um, the uh, electorate 
many of whom in Scotland have been asking for new tax powers, is that the 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 amount the money that's that's transferred um, uh, is called the block grant. So th there's a block grant to Scotland, a block grant to Northern Ireland, block, block grant to Wales. It has to be adjusted once the uh, Scottish government say is given the power to to uh, uh, collect all the income tax that is raised in Scotland, which is about fourteen billion pounds. So uh, to maintain equity, the block grants had to be adjusted, uh, and it's quite easy to do that in the first year. You just knock off however however much money the income tax would have raised. So that your the the net the net effect is, is zero in in year one, the the issue is how do you design the block grant in subsequent years to incentivize say Scotland to increase its income tax revenues. This is I'm not going to go into the details of all. It's quite complicated. It is utterly opaque to the. Um, Scottish population, very few people understand what's going on in relation to the block grant, but it is really important because effectively, if Scotland's performance starts to fall relative to that of England in terms of income tax generation, then the amount of money that the Scottish government will have to spend would be less than it would have had it just st stuck with the Barnett formula. Uh, I, yeah, if anyone's interested, I can go into the details of this, but it's 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 quite convoluted. It, what what it what this arrangement does is to change the risk reward incentives that the devolved governments face. So in effect, um, so Scotland got this power. Uh, post the referendum, but Wales also now has an income tax. Um, uh, powers over income tax, but a different block grant uh, arrangement. So it it arranged a different uh, block grant with the Treasury, or block grant adjustment with the Treasury than did Scotland. So um, there's no consistency around, around the way that this is being applied. So here's a, a diagram that may help you understand what, what's going on. Um, the key issue is, um, this should let's see if I can get it to work. Yeah. Um, so in, this is sort of pre the uh, addition of powers to Scotland. So the treasury uh, receives taxes mainly from the English population, but some from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It allocates money via, largely via needs assessments to the English population. So for example, the amount distributed to the health service in England will reflect uh, need, the need, needs of different parts of the country. Same is true of education, same may be true of uh, local government. The different arrangements, which applies to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is the Barnet formula. Um, and that's, uh, how spending feeds through the amounts of revenue coming from the population into the Scottish government are relatively small compared with the with the block grant. Uh, this is pre uh, the the granting of powers, but once the powers were were allocated, I'm not sure if my um, if you can see, but the amount coming from via the the Barnet formula to Scotland decreases. The income tax increases going to Scotland. Uh, and what triggers the Barnet formula is decisions about England that the Ch UK Chancellor of the Exchequer makes. So if he decides to increase spending on health, that's what then triggers the, the Barnet formula into, into action. Of course, if they cut spending, then the amount going is also cut. Um, and notice the, the heading here is funding mechanism for comparable policies. So there is a the the, tr the treasury uh, uh, has a document which uh, lists what it deems to be comparable 
spending. So health, 100%, education, 100%, and so on. Well, that has become a somewhat malleable in the last few years. And one of the um, features of Brexit has been that the, the understanding of what are comparable policies has been changed. And the Scottish government in particular <clears throat> is, is arguing, and I'll come on to this, that Brexit has led to the UK government spending money in Scotland and looking to take credit in Scotland for um, infrastructure spending, for spending on education, uh, which would normally be uh, 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 under the, the, this, the, that kind of spending would, would come only through, under the auspices of the, uh, of the Scottish government. So that has, uh, I don't think it's, it's penetrated much into the common discourse, but it has got the Scottish government extremely upset, and I'll explain why as I go over that. Uh, this is the, the, or these are the latest figures on spending per head. So the argument made uh, by the by politicians in England who are fed up with Scotland asking for independence <clears throat> often claim that uh, Scotland gets more than its fair share, whatever that might be, whatever a needs assessment might suggest in terms of spending per head. And indeed, you can see here that spending per head in Scotland, Wales, and especially Northern Ireland is much higher than the English spend per head, although the spend per head varies across, across the different parts of England considerably. Why has this? Well, this, why has this become a focus of attention? One of the big arguments around that is that so-called levelling up has become a very important feature of political discourse in the UK. But that's mainly focusing on England and, and is a result of work particularly by a uh, friend who I'm meeting tomorrow <laughs> to discuss some of these issues, um, Philip McCann in Sheffield, um, who has pointed out in, in several influential articles that regional inequality in the UK is, is greater than any of the EU states, I think. Uh, there are very few countries in the world with greater degrees of regional inequality and what leveling up is about is is supposedly improving performance in uh, regions that lag behind in GDP per head such as the northeast of England, Yorkshire, um, the southeast uh, and so on. I, one of the ways of thinking about Scotland which <clears throat> um, doesn't go down very well a, in nationalist circles is that it's about average. In UK terms, it's about average. It gets in terms of productivity per head uh, uh, and, and many of the sort of key economic indicators, but it does get more public spending per head via the Barnett formula. And that is, as I said, a source of resentment. One of the issues around Northern Ireland about Irish unity is, is hesitancy on the part of um, the Republic uh, about the amount of public spending per head in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, uh, the, or the level, and what that might mean uh, under uh, if Ireland was to be united again. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let me just—I'll do a couple of quick slides on the on the uh, pandemic because. What I've described is a situation where there's no rules. It, there, there's no legal um, uh, basis on which the, the, the funding arrangements that I've been describing are, 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 um, are embedded. 
But during COVID, there was a huge increase in, in borrowing uh, by the UK government to fund a massive increase in health spending in um, England. And the devolved governments were left wondering, well, what, would, what was going to happen to them? A lot of these changes were being made within a fiscal year. The budgets had already been allocated to the devolved government, so they didn't know what they were going to do. Uh, but the Treasury came up with a, new, a completely new scheme, and, and since it can decide exactly uh, how to allocate uh, resources to the uh, uh, devolved territories, um, it was perfectly able to do this. Uh, it devised a thing called the Barnett Guarantee, which effectively promised the devolved governments um, the consequential Barnet increases that were um, being uh, that the consequences that were the consequence of increased spending in England. So decisions could be made very quickly about uh, changes to health spending in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland because of this guarantee. Otherwise, they, 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 there was a, a danger that they just wouldn't have had the resources to match the kinds of um, schemes, not only the health spending, but what was called the furlough scheme, whereby uh, uh, it, uh, the government pay, part paid the salaries of individuals in, in businesses that it did, had effectively shut down. So that, that in a way showed the benefits of not having rigid rules uh, around, uh, around spending. Um, and it, it enabled the UK uh, to muddle through again. Um, uh, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the borrowing powers for the devolved governments are very limited. And so one route that they might have had, or they might have been able to use had the borrowing been limits been more generous would be would have been to borrow on their own behalf but that was not a route that was open to them because the the the, the borrowing limits were far too tight to allow that happening to happen so as in consequence they they had to uh, they had to uh, uh, go for uh, or had to accept what the treasury uh, what what the treasury arrangements were okay let me uh, now going to Brexit, um, clearly it was an unforeseen change. Uh, it was unwelcome, certainly in Northern Ireland and Scotland. <clears throat> and the post-Brexit outcomes or arrangements that were put in place, and I'll explain these in a minute, did not take account of the uh, outcomes. But it also happened when the tax and welfare arrangements in Scotland and in Wales were already changing following the 2014 independence referendum. So the adjustments to income tax, to the welfare powers and to other taxes were taking place. And that was overlaid by uh, the unexpected effects associated with Brexit. So the return of powers from Europe post-Brexit led to quite considerable redistribution of power, economic powers within the UK. Well, yes, um, uh, yes, in, in the sense that a lot of power came to the UK, but the distribution within the UK has been quite limited. Um, the kinds, and I'll explain why, um, but the kinds of things that I'm talking about are, um, how post-Brexit would um, borders, trade agreements be arranged? How would state aid be dealt with? How would the internal market be regulated in the UK? Would option, new options that would open up post-Brexit uh, in terms of tax devolution within the UK, such as ch changes in, in uh, VAT, uh, would these be... Um, exploited, and then what new di uh, directions for economic development uh, spending might be taken <clears throat> uh, af after the uh, after 
EU structural funds were no longer available. And that touches on the levelling up agenda, which the, the UK government has, has described as central to its mission, its current mission. And politically, it's extremely important because a large number of the 2019 uh, Conservative members of Parliament have come from parts of England which were uh, uh, not at all prosperous uh, and, uh, and who are looking for uh, real uh, effective economic measures to, uh, to ensure that this so-called levelling up uh, becomes reality. Okay, so to be more specific, uh, there have been a number of uh, um, measures put in place. Three, uh, um, well, they're not. They're not all. Yeah, they are. They're mostly legislated, uh, or the legislation has gone through. A, a lot of this was not thought out, uh, I, even during the Brexit process. What was going? What What was necessary? to be put in place. Um, the Shared Prosperity Fund was promised in 2017, but the prospectus for the Shared Prosperity Fund, which is what is going to replace the EU structural funds, was only announced two months ago. So a lot of the legislation, the regulations were clearly not uh, not uh, significantly, there, there was no significant preparation for them, um, even post um, uh, post the, the, the referendum in 2016. So common frameworks, internal market acts, subsidy control bill, shared prosperity fund. Um, the common frameworks was actually an effort by the UK government to be, to a certain extent, cohesive around um, EU laws that were being brought, obviously, back to the UK. And there were, uh, for a couple of years, discussions between the UK government and the devolved governments uh, around uh, what were very detailed uh, issues and agreement set up as to how they would be administered and <clears throat> the um, um, regulations associated with them would be put in place. Um, and, uh, and it was essential to, to modify, uh, uh, sorry, to, to deal with possible policy divergence on EU, EU exit. It, it is important to remember that Scottish law is not the same as English law. And so therefore the, the, there were possibilities for, for, for many uh, divergences um, post Brexit. Um, so uh, some progress uh, had, was made, but uh, limited. Uh, things that are really quite detailed uh, company law, late payments for for um, of bills, radioactive substances were all agreed, and and there are a number of others. But clearly, you know, there were thousands of such issues that were uh, uh, came back as a result of um, Brexit. So discussing them one by one uh, uh, would take a very long time. And, and, and these discussions, as far as I understand it, have, have kind of petered out. Uh, one thing that is, has a much broader effect is the Internal Market Act, which is how competition is going to be regulated within, within the UK. Uh, and, and I'll talk about that now. Um, The first is, that, so there are two main principles uh, underlying this uh, in law. Uh, so this is <clears throat> about ensuring that there is, the, 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 the market, markets within the UK remain competitive. Um, and there's the mutual recognition 
component, which is it's an interesting if a good is compliant with the statutory rules relating to its sale in part of the UK, then it will be automatically accepted anywhere else. <clears throat> this is quite um, this is contentious. Um, it sort of implies that, for example, if up in Scotland we set uh, higher standards on building insulation um, because of our colder climate, that wouldn't hold because um, <clears throat> uh, insulation produced in England and it acceptable in England would have to remain acceptable in Scotland as well. So anything produced in one part of the UK has to be, and, and, and meeting the regulations of that part of the UK uh, has to be, is or is deemed acceptable also in uh, 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 any other part. And uh, the non-discrimination <clears throat> is, is around how um, you're not allowed to discriminate against goods from other parts uh, of the of the UK, either directly or or indirectly. <clears throat> the Internal Market Act, in an additional uh, provision, also gave U UK ministers power to provide assistance to any part of the UK in relation to the set of a um, <clears throat> areas. So the promotion of economic development, provision of infrastructure, uh, culture, education, and so on. This was a provision built into the Internal Market Act to effectively allow the UK government to channel the what's called the UK Shared Prosperity Fund uh, into other part, into the devolved uh, territories and the key point about that is that economic development infrastructure culture and sporting education and training are all <clears throat> functions that you would describe as comparable so they tend to fall within the barnet formula and therefore are deemed by the treasury to be uh, functions carried out by the respective governments. The Internal Market Act is saying, well, no, uh, the UK government can also decide to spend in these areas in the devolved territories. So um, we are expecting that, whereas we used to have um, the EU flag on, say, infrastructure projects uh, in, uh, in Scotland and uh, right across the UK, of course, when, when the structural funds were used to part fund these, then now we're going to get Union Jacks coming in to, to show that it's the UK government that's, uh, that's supporting these kinds of activity. Um, I, I'm not going to waste time the, on, on, the, on the detail of this. The, <clears throat> so there was also a, a need to uh, repair replace EU state aid regulations. <clears throat> and that came through something called the subsidy control bill. Now that is, that's clearly a, 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 um, a, a piece of legislation that the EU itself has a lot of interest in because it doesn't want the UK government to subsidize, to subsidize um, UK industry to the detriment of EU providers uh, or, or companies. Uh, it's also has the um, devolved governments have an interest in this because they often want feel that they would like to support industries within their own territories. So the um, uh, subsidy control bill uh, uh, is set up largely to make sure or to make the EU happy around the um, provision of uh, state aid or subsidies uh, within the UK. But as far as the devolved governments are concerned, they were not consulted at all in relation to this, uh, in relation to this bill. Um, 
sorry, Professor Bill, Bell, yeah. may I interrupt you? It, can you come somehow to a conclusion in yep, some yep, minutes I'll, just I'll, to allow also the others? Sorry, sorry to interrupt because yeah, yeah. it's extremely no interesting and full of content, but sorry. Yeah. Okay. Very unpleasant it's, it's, I, I am I am near I am near the end. Um the uh subsidy control unit is is is, is really um being set up and it's the UK level. Um there's no role whatsoever for the devolved governments in relation to this. So the devolved governments have to go and ask uh, the UK government around uh, around uh, subsidy uh, controls. Um, this is the last the last um, effective measure. Shared Prosperity Fund a, is a poor substitute for EU structural funds. The view is that it will not be sufficient to do very much of the leveling up that the UK <clears throat> um, uh, government uh, claims is uh, it, it, it's it, it, one of its principal objectives. Um, the uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland will no longer have the roles that the EU granted them in relation to these funds. Um, uh, and the Welsh government described it as a direct attack on devolution. So um, the, it, 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 they took a long time to decide on a very um, inferior measure and did not take much opportunity to uh, redesign it in a way that might have made it more effective than the, than the EU uh, structural funds approach. So we've ended up with a situation which muddling through has become even more muddled. Um, we now have a sort of competitive rather than cooperative devolution. Um, there has been no consultation on trade deals with the um, uh, devolved territories, although you know, other countries like Canada do involve the provinces around uh, around trade negotiations. Uh, and so um, Brexit clearly caused a major shock to intergovernmental relations. Most of the powers, and this is the, the bone of contention that the devolved governments have, have been retained by the UK government when there was the opportunity to, to um, become more inclusive and, and let the uh, structure, sorry, the devolved governments um, play a significant role in the post-Brexit arrangement. Um, and, and there are just many political obstacles, partly because of the differences in the, in the, in the uh, outlooks of the parties in control of the different parts of the of the UK, all of which are, are pretty much different. You've got Conservatives in London, Labour in Wales, Scottish Nationalists in, in Scotland, and Unionists in Ireland, and, and that doesn't make for a good mix in terms of bringing forward intergovernmental uh, cooperation. Okay, that's sorry for ru running over a bit, but that's my contribution. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Bell, for this, this very interesting presentation with a lot of information that um, we, we didn't really had in clear in mind regarding the effects of Brexit. Um, I see already some questions, but what I wanted to say is that you can already write questions in the, um, in the chat. But uh, I think that we collect all of them and we post them to the speakers at the end, so that now we go on to the second um, presentation uh, of this morning. Uh, allow me to introduce Professor Chanchal Kumar Sharma. Are you here? No? Okay. Um, so <laughs> maybe if... Professor William Saunders is agreed to start with his presentation right now, so that maybe it's even better for the jet lag. Is it fine with you? Yes, I can jump in. That's fine. Okay. So yeah. allow me to introduce Professor William Saunders. <laughs> so um, 
he will give a presentation on Australian fiscal federalism uh, with the subtitle Size Matters Among Subnational Jurisdiction. Professor William Saunders is Honorary Associate Professor at the Center for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research of the Australian National University. And we discussed at the beginning why we asked him for a presentation on fiscal federalism because he's an expert on Aboriginal rights, let's say. Uh, this is the, the idea of the, of the project to combine fiscal federalism with diversity accommodation. So I think that his profile really fit <coughs> Into, into the in today in today's workshop. Um, in fact, among his research interests, I would like to mention that he covers the political and social aspects of indigenous policies as well as the economic. So I don't want to, um, to occupy much more time. And um, Professor Sanders, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, and thank you, everyone else, for joining. I will just share my screen uh, as I've got a um, a uh, PowerPoint here to go. Okay, um, this is who I am, um, and that's my title, as Alice has as has said. Um, this is where I am. I'm in the uh, high country in Australia, in uh, the mountains in southeastern Australia, in our national capital, uh, Canberra. And that's our acknowledgement of country uh, from the Australian National University. We acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work um, and whose cultures are continuing. Uh, this is a map of Australia, just so we can all be on the same page. Um, uh, so, and there's a there's a British connection here uh, to follow on from David's talk. Um, Australia has six states, which uh, were colonies of Great Britain, established in the um, late. 1700s and during the early 1800s. Five of those states in the south and east of the continent uh, were given self-government in the 1850s and one Western Australia was given a self-government in the 1890s. Um, the, polit the politicians from those uh, um, six self-governing colonies um, Basically, well, there was a federation movement which started from about the 1860s, um, which had two things in mind, basically pulling more power away from Britain to Australia and also resolving some issues that were um, popping, uh, cropping up between the six self-governing colonies. So there was constitutional conventions. Uh, and constitution writing during the 1890s in Australia between uh, from colonial politicians from the six states, uh, which you can see there, New South Wales, Victoria, the, 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 in the southeast, then uh, William, uh, one, one second. Yep. Could, could you please yep. move your slides? Because we still see the, the, the initial slide. Ah, OK. Okay, I have moved my slide. Um, we still see the, the the initial one. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, now are you getting now, it? Now they're moving. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank good. You. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thanks, uh, Francisco. Thanks for butting in. I can't see you at all, so uh, um, keep jumping in if you if things aren't working. Um, so you didn't see that was the that's the high country that I live in. Um, you missed that one. So there's the, uh, the six, six uh, um, self-governing colonies, which become, became states when New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland and Tasmania along the eastern seaboard, South Australia uh, in, the, in the south, uh, Western Australia in the west, which was the last to be given self-government. Uh, and then um, there's two territories as well, which we'll come to. Um, um, and so the the, the uh, basically the, the chapter 
structure that I've devised for this paper. And this is a paper written specifically uh, at, for this uh, collection and uh, webinar. I haven't uh, uh, just, um, it's not something I was working on, but when Francisco approached me, uh, I thought, yeah, there's there's some interesting stuff to do here. Um, so the first uh, bit of it is to establish the constitutional origins. So the, what those uh, po um, colonial politicians devised as a written constitution. So there is a, a written constitution here. It's not the good chap theory of government here. It, there is a written constitution. And so it was laid down in a, uh, a constitutional document which um, the colonial politicians sent to the parliament in Westminster and basically asked uh, that parliament to, um, to, to pass in, and they did so in 1900. Um, then there's a section on the early practice of uh, uh, that, that led that from following those constitutional origins, uh, which I call small state claims and Commonwealth growth. And that, that goes through to 1933. Um, then um, there's a section on the uh, establishment of the, a thing called the Commonwealth Grants Commission. Uh, and um, the, uh, at its first 60 years, when it was um, focused on general revenue sharing um, between the six states, the, the six um, founding states that were there. Um, another, then a section on specific purpose payments, um, and which we'll come to, and then a, a, a section on eight-way sharing. Um, and then two case studies on the end, one on Western Australia, how a once small secessionist state become, becomes big, and one, a, a little case study about Northern Territory, how a big indigenous population complicates general revenue sharing. Um, uh, so, and then I'll come back, it, my, I haven't written this yet, but I'll come back to some conclusions on the accommodation of economic and population density diversity, because that's the sort of um, diversity that is in Australian federalism. There's, it's not uh, cultural, um, uh, it's it uh, it's not cultural diversity uh, between different states, although th though there is this indigenous big population uh, in the in the Northern Territory case study. Um, it's a, it's it's mainly popular. It's a, a, a story about diverse economic structures that come from very different population densities uh, and very different land areas. And just to give you a sense of that, I thought we might do a little bit of um, just a little bit of basic population stuff and land area stuff so that you can see, I mean, the, the, the map doesn't make Australia look very diverse, um, but it is, there's a sort of southeast corner, which is densely settled in um, uh, Victoria and uh, the eastern half of New South Wales and up to Brisbane in the south of Queensland and across to Adelaide in, in the east of South Australia. So there's a sort of southeast corner there. Uh, and that's where the big populations are and it's densely settled. Uh, and if you look back or if you look at the uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, the first two, you can see that New South Wales and Victoria, which, is the, which are the big population centres, uh, accounted in 2016 for uh, sixty-seven point five percent of the population, even though they're only thirteen point four percent of the um, the land area. Uh, Tasmania, you can put in that um, southeast corner as well. Um, it, it's a small bit of uh, the southeast, the densely populated southeast, and so too is the Australian Capital Territory, which gets added. It's as you can see, it sits halfway between Melbourne and Sydney in the in the corridor. And maybe in the table, I should put it across in that group. To, but that's where the population group is, the, the southeast population group is. Um, the next group uh, is a group of two, which I've, Queensland and South Australia, you can, they just sort of sit to the to the north and the west of, of the southeast corner. And in a sense, they straddle 
what you might think of as densely populated Australia and sparsely uh, settled Australia. Uh, each of them has a sort of a bit of densely populated Australia in its either its southeast in the case of Brisbane or in its um, or in its southeast in both instances, and then they have rather large hinterlands. Um, the last group of uh, which sort of represents the diversity when we come to Western Australia and the Northern Territory. These are very large land areas with sparse settlement outside their cities of Perth in the West and Darwin in the North. Um, and, and, and Darwin is only a city of 100,000 people. Uh, Perth's larger, um, over a million, but uh, the, uh, these are, these, this is sparsely settled Australia. Uh, and it's a large land area. As you can see, if you look at the land area, Western Australia alone is a third of Australia and the Northern Territory is another 17.5%. So uh, together, basically they're half Australia's land area, um, but they're only uh, looking at the 2016 population there, they're only 11.5% uh, of the population. So that half of Australia only has a little over 10% of the population. So these are, that's a very big diversity in um, population and economic structure as well. I haven't got economic structure uh, statistics at this stage, um, but uh, that's something I'd be looking to add. Um, if we look back um, to uh, 1900, the time when uh, of federation, uh, the uh, the dominance of the southeast was in terms of population was even stronger um, 36 plus 32 plus 4 that's um 70 percent in that southeast corner uh and western australia as you can uh, see was only at 4.8 percent at that point we're, we're, so so there's been growth in the outlying areas um uh, in during the 20th century and a lot of that growth has been in the latter path. So the, there's been growth in Queensland and population growth in Queensland and a big population growth in Western Australia and that's been in the latter path. And so there's been tensions around where that growth uh, occurs and where relative declines going on. So that's just um, a little bit of background to go back. Uh, I'll, I'll now work through sort of the history stuff and then get to the the Western Australian and um, Northern Territory case studies. So um, constitutional origins and early practice that what in this slide basically covers what I think of as the first two sections of the paper. Um, the 19th century uh, self-governing colonies um, developed uh, some differences around customs um, and um, so Victoria became more protectionist, New South Wales became, was sort of more free trade um, and they, they had differential customs to the outside world and customs to each other. So in fact, uh, there were things called customs houses along this river, that the, the Murray River here, which, joined, which joins the two. Um, you can go and find a customs house along the Murray River, if, um, which is now a bit of a historical uh, um, sort of relic, you might say. So free free interstate trade or free intercolonial trade is a big issue. Um, the colonies are becoming the states. And uh, that is in the written Australian constitution, um, free interstate trade is guaranteed by section 92. Um, the customs and excise power in, this, in the, uh, the constitution that was devised in the 1890s and, and sent to the Westminster Parliament for uh, to pass was gave uh, an exclusive power over customs and excise to the new Commonwealth and that was in section 90. So this um, set up Commonwealth financial dominance um, uh, in terms of revenue customs and excise was about three quarters of revenue in the in the um, 1890s um, and as one of the commentators on this that I read said, this, it was well and un truly understood that this was giving the Commonwealth a very um, 
good revenue source. Uh, and there were other parts of the, the constitution which uh, instructed the Commonwealth to hand back uh, to the states um, uh, revenues for at least 10 years uh, from its customs and excise. Uh, and th those transitional provisions uh, that um, expired after 10 years, in a sense, set up some expectations, which was that the Commonwealth would continue to return revenue to the states. And it did so uh, on a per capita basis, um, but with the small states making claims for uh, special grants in addition to their per capita uh, um, uh, payments. And these were under section 96 of the constitution, which basically says that the Commonwealth can make payments to the states um, on whatever conditions it likes um, and, and, and put conditions on those grants, uh, whatever, make it whatever grants, it, it, it payments it wants and put conditions on them. So in the early years, um, Tasmania and Western Australia were claimant states almost immediately. Um, they started claiming, uh, setting up claims as early as 1903 uh, and uh, getting, they, was, they were getting uh, uh, payments in addition to their per capita pay, uh, uh, return uh, uh, as early as 1910. So um, at that point, Australia, Western Tasmania was, was small. Um, both in both population and land area. Western Australia, of course, was small in population, but big in land area. Um, South Australia became a uh, claimant state in the late 1920s, um, at which point once half your states have become claimant states, uh, it, it, the, it, the, it, the, the point, the idea that these outlying states had an ongoing financial problem became more in a sort of entrenched in Australian politics. And so the Commonwealth um, began to move towards systematizing a claims process rather than just making ad hoc uh, payments each un un in response to claims from various state governments. So the Commonwealth moves to systematise the, the, pro, the claims process by setting up a thing called the Commonwealth Grants Commission in 1933. Uh, so it's passed by a piece of Commonwealth legislation. Um, and the Commonwealth Grants Commission um, consists of three independent commissioners, one of whom the, well, the, tends to be an economist, a lawyer, and one other. And the one other tends to be a sort of someone who's um, sympathetic to the claims of the small, uh, the small outlying states, or the outlying states that that they're being disadvantaged by, by fed, uh, federation, um, and that Commonwealth Grants Commission that gets set up in 1933 is is still around today and has a long um, history and basically has become a sort of technocratic advisor to the Commonwealth on how to um, share general, do general revenue sharing between these, the subnational jurisdictions. Um, that the Commonwealth Grants Commission, the economists in it in particular set up the principle of fiscal equalization in the first three years of its existence. And they set up the idea that this would be adjusted annually and that there'd be a, an annual system of hearings and reports. Um, the, so the first 50 years through from 1933 to 1980, basically the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Grants Commission, the CGC, uh, advises on six way general revenue sharing. Um, where the, um, the three states um, that, have, that have set themselves up as claimant states in the early years uh, continue to um, appear before the commission each year and make their claims uh, uh, to get 
more than their per capita share of general revenue sharing. And in the 1960s, even Queensland adds itself to the list of climate states. So we get to the point where four of the six states are actually climate states um, and making their annual submissions and only the sort of core New South Wales and Victoria, um, which is sort of industrial heartland, um, are seen as uh, not making claims and of course they they wear the consequences um, but in in terms of not not um, letting the claimant states get away with too much i think most of the heavy lifting in those years is done by the commonwealth treasury pushing backs against a bit a bit um, so new south wales and victoria i'm not I don't think make submissions to the Grants Commission in these years, but I will check that. Uh, but basically Commonwealth Treasury does most of the sort of pushing back against the claims. So the three commissioners of the, this, this independent statutory body write annual reports and they recommend um, the, what, the special grants that um, the claimant states should get above the, and beyond the per capita general revenue sharing. Um, generally, the Prime Minister and the Commonwealth accept the recommendations, um, generally, almost invariably, uh, they, well, invariably, they accept the recommendations on sharing and um, uh, they act on it. There's more haggling and co in conflict in these years over the size of the pool for sharing than the um, the relative sharing figures um, and there's calls for guaranteed pools because sometimes the Commonwealth restricts the pool to something smaller than um, the states would like so the, the size of the pool becomes an issue and for example there's calls in the late 1970s or oh, there's an agreement that personal income sharing um, would to set the size of the pool that's being shared. Um, the, in the bottom half of this slide, there's a sec the second uh, story about Section 96. Um, in parallel with this, so everything I've talked about so far in the Commonwealth Grants Commission and that story is all about general revenue sharing um, and uh, small states making claims to getting more than a per capita share. This story is another one under Section 96. Uh, it's a it's it's the parallel development of Commonwealth payments to the states for specific policy purposes. So the Commonwealth at various points in time starts making um, payments to the states under Section 96, which under which it can make payments to the states and put whatever conditions on it likes. Um, and in, it does so basically in the 1920s relating to roads, in the 1940s relating to housing, and you can see health in, and then education comes in. And basically this is a way of the Commonwealth can move into policy areas beyond its list of powers in section 51 of the constitution that was written in the 1890s. So the Commonwealth has no roads power, it has no housing power, but it can make its uh, policy influence felt by making grants to the states in areas like roads and housing and putting and putting policy conditions on it. You know, you, you will spend this money in this sort of way. In the 18, 1940s, for example, the Commonwealth basically said uh, to the states, we will give you money to do public housing. Um, and so a public housing system grew up in the late 1940s at using Commonwealth money directed through the states on conditions to be... Uh, in the 1960s, the Commonwealth gets into um, education, um, directing policy around um, universities and uh, other bits of education through the through Section 96. So this becomes a big part of Australian federalism. Uh, at uh, it's at high, the high, it gets up to 50% of the money that's flowing from the Commonwealth to the states in the 1970s um, is going through this other other uh, mechanism called special purpose payments. So this allows the Commonwealth into um, its power uh, in in a area policy areas beyond its list of powers in section 51 of the constitution this is criticized often and there is some resistance from the states about the commonwealth meddling in things that were constitutionally supposed to be the province of the states but the commonwealth persists it's not put off um, 
and from um, the Commonwealth has section 96, so it uses section 96. Um, from the, the Grants Commission's perspective, the Commonwealth Grants Commission's perspective, this flow of special purpose payments to the states complicates general revenue sharing, but it basically accommodates this by taking them into account in its fiscal equalisation. So if particular states get more or less special purpose payments, then that becomes part of their sources of revenue that gets um, taken into account by the in the general revenue sharing. Um, so that's the um, from the 1980s. The um, the common the general revenue sharing exercise that is presided over by the uh, Commonwealth Grants Commission uh, changes to an eight-way general revenue sharing exercise um, because the Commonwealth gives self-government to two territories in the Northern Territory and the ACT. And if we just flick back to the map, you can see where they are. This, this part of the Australia is part of sparsely settled Australia. Um, it was administered directly by, it, uh, it was originally uh, referred to as the Northern Territory of South Australia in, back in the 1800s. Uh, South Australia surrendered it to the Commonwealth soon after Federation because the Commonwealth had, it was pretty expensive to run this sparsely settled area and the Commonwealth had plenty of money so they gave it over to the Commonwealth. This of course here is the Australian Capital Territory which is halfway between Sydney and Melbourne because neither of them was going to let the other be the capital of Australia. Um, so we started a new city and a, and a small territory. The Commonwealth got sick of sort of running these territories. Uh, it did so up until the 1970s. Um, and then it decided to give them self-government to let them run themselves. So they became the seventh and eighth subnational jurisdictions, um, and that and the com and they became part of the general revenue sharing exercise, um, as well as adding two extra general revenue subject national jurisdictions. Um, the the Commonwealth Grants um, Commission also moves away from the claimant states approach to uh, a, what is a relativities approach and relativities so the, the, what it produces from the 1980s onwards is annual reports which um, produce relativities numbers now relativities numbers are above and below one um, with one representing a per capita distribution. So if you have a relativity number below one as a jurisdiction, you get less than a per capita uh, distribution back in general revenue sharing. And if you have a relativity number above one, uh, you get more than a per capita distribution back. It's still an annual process. The relativities figures are produced annually, um, but it's less, it seems to me it's less now or about um, the claimant states just making their claims. It's about all jurisdictions making submissions and uh, arguing the, the, the toss around their relativities. So the big states have got involved uh, in the annual process as well. From 2000 onwards, goods and services taxes identified were identified as a pool for general revenue sharing. Um, and that comes back to the, the sort of tussling that goes on over uh, the size of the pool. Um, uh, and basically, uh, I'd say, come back to the basic point that the Commonwealth pretty much always accepts and implements the, the, the uh, relativities produced by the Commonwealth Grants Commission each year. Um, and the, the Commonwealth finds its flexibility through other, other tax pools and through um, like income tax, which is another big pool, and also through specific purpose payments. So it's the, the Commonwealth in a sense um, finds it easier uh, to the tech, there's this technocratic exercise by the Commonwealth Grants Commission, and that's respected uh, always, and that's how general revenue sharing happens, but there is playing around the edges. Um, and the Commonwealth can occasionally do side deals while respecting the, the uh, CGC's um, independence and work. And I'll, and I'll say a little bit about that in my last, um, last slide. So this slide here is um, 
the relativities that have been produced at five-year intervals by the Commonwealth Grants Commission. And, our, and a relativity above one, or below one means you're getting less than your per capita share back in of revenues and above one um, means you're getting more than your per capita share back in revenue. Um, and from this, you can, I could, this is quite a good lead into the two, the WA stories and the Northern Territory stories. So um, you can see that by, if we just look at WA, uh, by 1995, WA is, uh, is, is, is still a little bit above one. So it's getting more than its uh, per capita share back. It's, uh, it's a bit on, it's on a bit of a par with uh, South Australia and Queensland. Um, and, and of course the, the big central uh, uh, states are, are, are below one. But what happens over time is that uh, suddenly over the next 25 years, Western Australia, becomes drops below one and very dramatically below one. Now, what's happening here, of course, is that there's a um, mining boom starting up in Western Australia around about here. Uh, and the, uh, and the, the tax, the uh, royalties from um, iron ore mining um, uh, go to the state government. And so the state government suddenly has a, a new ability to raise revenue that it hasn't had before, and its relativity actually drops very, very, very low. Uh, and so it becomes, it moves from being a, a big, a small climate state in the early years to being a big provider of, of, uh, uh, of being having a higher than much higher than average capacity to to raise its own revenue and uh, and 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 its relativity uh, falls away. Um, this effectively um, um, in a, well in a sense this one of the things I should say back in the 1930s Western Australia did have a, a, a sort of a, a move to be uh, to secede uh, about, about the time when the Commonwealth Grants Commission was was set up uh, and this sets up some revisiting of secessionist tendencies in in Western Australia, because they're sort of saying, well, we, why do we, this is effectively what this sort of figure means here is that effectively, even though Western Australia is technically uh, get what well, is getting the, the, the mineral royalty from iron ore mining, the adjustment through the Commonwealth Grants Commission process is effectively taking a, a very large portion of that money away from it. Um, and, and sort of um, de facto nationalizing the mineral royalty and, and putting it in the, in the pool. Um, so this has actually reignited some secessionist tendencies in, in Western Australia. And to, uh, um, to get over this, actually, the Commonwealth, the, the Commonwealth government has respected these, com this, these, these are the relativities that, that um, uh, have come out of the Commonwealth Grants Commission's technocratic exercise. Uh, the Commonwealth continues to respect them, but it actually has done a side deal to, uh, for, a, for a number of years to push this figure back up to 0.7 for Western Australia. And that's actually sort of keeping Western Australia in um, and stopping them sort of saying, um, come on, we're, 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 we're providing this um, iron ore royalties to, for the whole uh, government. And so why can't we just uh, have it ourselves and secede? So that's actually, uh, that's the technical numbers that come out of the Commonwealth Grants Commission. But there is a side deal being gone on for a few years to push this, big, this number here back up to 0.7 to keep it Western Australia happy. The Northern Territory, um, so that's the Northern, that's the Western Australia story. The Northern Territory story, you can see um, the Northern Territory gets five or four times per capita money. And that's much more than Tasmania has always been the, the 1.7, 1.8 would it has always been the, uh, the, the highest bar. But the, once the Northern Territory comes in, it gets five times per capita. Um, and 
there's a story there which I won't do too much on here, but the Northern Territory, if we go back to that earlier slide, well, has a very small population, but a very significant um, Indigenous proportion of that population. So here, the, here's the Northern Territory's population, 1% of the total national population, um, but 9% uh, nine, 9 of Indigenous population nationally, or 30% of the local population, 30% um, of this this population of 250,000 roughly is Indigenous. And that has um, created uh, an interesting politics in the Northern, around the Northern Territory, um, because basically if we go back to the relativities uh, figure, this figure, uh, some of the disadvantage and need elements in this figure relate to indigenous populations in particularly in remote areas uh, but this is general revenue sharing so that there's a there's a sort of debate that goes on the northern territory gets its money from the commonwealth by arguing by having these arguments about how much greater the needs of people in remote areas are but then when it gets the money it's often tempted to spend it in the suburbs of Darwin. Um, and that creates some interesting um, sort of dynamics within Northern Territory politics and in with national politics about how is it that you have re general revenue sharing, that you have these disability factors, but you're not obliged to spend it on the, on the disabilities through which you get the money. And I think that's... Um, there's some so there's some interesting stuff there that the, the Western Australian and Northern Territory um, uh, figures play out. So now, one last slide I've got. Um, basically, this just to come back to the issue of um, diversity. Um, there is deep diversity in Australian federalism. Um, which is even deeper than is shown sometimes when you look at the jurisdiction levels. Um, and it is a deep, it's a diversity between dense settlement and um, sparse settlement. And that's in a sense what's being managed here. And this is another geography which just basically divides the in Australian population in 2016, the 24 million. Uh, a slightly different way, and you can see that in these these two light shaded areas of very remote Australia and remote Australia, there's only actually of the order of 500,000 people out of 24 million. The other um, 23 million are, are in the in the, the the regional the cities and regional areas so this is the big diversity and it cuts across states the northern territory is pretty much all in this sparsely settled area except for a city of darwin perth you can see has a huge um, sparsely settled area and and a, and a small um, densely settled area and then the the eastern seaboard so that's the diversity that's being accommodated in Australian federalism and ramifying right through the fiscal federal system. And that's me. And I will stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Professor Sanders, for this very dense and interesting presentation, which gave a perspective on a different approach to diversity, but yeah. still very interesting. We could learn a lot, especially living on the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I think now it's time to present the third speaker of this morning. Mm, again, if you want to pose questions, just write them in the Q&A and we will then collect them all. Uh, Professor Chanchal Kumar Sharma will uh, today give us a presentation on fiscal federalism and diversity accommodation, providing insights from India. Um, he is professor of political science at the Department of Political Science of the Central University of uh, Haryana, and he is associate at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies at Hamburg in Germany from 2006 on onward. 
He has published extensively on fiscal federalism with the special focus on India from a political scientist perspective, but not limited to India because his works also include uh, uh, studies of comparative uh, nature. Uh, I think now it's time to pass the floor to Professor Chanchal Kumar Sharma. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alice. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I am grateful to Francisco, Javier, and Alice for uh, associating me with this project uh, and uh, for providing me this wonderful opportunity to present my analysis on secessionism in India, uh, which is still a work in progress. So uh, the caveat here is that my conclusions are subject to considerable fine tuning in, my, in the next rounds of uh, my revisions. Uh, this, this, yeah. uh, <clears throat> uh, to make this uh, presentation self-contained, I would like to start with the reference to the broader literature on this subject uh, before coming to the case of India. Uh, when we are trying to understand the role of fiscal constitutions in diversity accommodation, it's important to understand uh, that uh, fiscal federalism or uh, federal finance in multi-level systems holds the key to creating perceptions among ethnic minorities or uh, uh, territorial uh, uh, communities toward fair distribution of wealth or economic justice. Therefore, fiscal constitutions are relevant in understanding mechanisms that forestall, trigger, perpetuate, exacerbate, or terminate uh, demands for secession, insofar as they hold the key to creating perceptions via two key policy instruments, that is uh, fiscal autonomy and uh, fiscal uh, equalization, both of which are seen as uh, policy measures for conflict resolution. However, uh, there is no unanimity amongst uh, scholars regarding the precise role these policies play. For instance, fiscal equalization which can potentially uh, resolve uh, regional imbalances on the one hand and pacify subnational grievances through financial compensation on the other, has been found in some studies to be promoting fiscal uh, uh, political instability by making prosperous regions subsidize their less well-off counterparts. In addition, uh, the evidence also indicates that Fiscal equalization may encourage inefficiency by uh, uh, softening uh, budget constraints. Likewise, fiscal autonomy, uh, which has been found to reduce the net payoff from secession in some cases, has been shown to actually increase incentives to secede in some other studies. In addition, the evidence also indicates that fiscal autonomy as a policy instrument tends to widen the existing regional uh, inequalities. Uh, so uh, in fact, there is a dividing line uh, between the traditional public finance literature, which ex uh, emphasizes the role of uh, 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 intergovernmental transfers and the public choice literature, which emphasizes fiscal autonomy. Not surprisingly, then the large and literature which uh, uh, seeks to uh, test these hypotheses arrives at inconclusive results. It's important to highlight that the literature on territorial accommodation of subnational identities pays scant attention to the uh, interaction between cultural heterogeneity and economically uh, based tensions that precede ethnic strife in many cases. Because of this uh, oversight, the large and empirical literature remains fragmented with scholars approaching this issue uh, from, from multiplicity of perspectives. Some scholars link uh, secessionist conflict to uh, economic inequality uh, between identity groups. Others emphasize uh, the role of political exclusion uh, from uh, access to state power. Still others have found no significant relationship between conflict and inequality, either in terms of political exclusion 
or economic deprivation of ethnic groups. This highlights the need for substantial case, uh, comparative case study work that systematically analyze interactions between uh, fiscal constitutions, economic disparities, ethnic divisions, and party politics under different objective conditions and contexts. In this regard, it's also important to underline that the literature on fiscal federalism and federal finance generally neglects uh, the fact that the problem of regional development or regional income disparities overlaps with the uh, nationalities problem in many cases, more so in developing countries such as India. To make sense of what I mean by this, let me state uh, one of the most generalizable findings, uh, which I call uh, the overlap thesis, which states that there is a necessary relationship between the questions of nationality and economic justice. According to this thesis then, the problems and patterns of ethnic separatism and secession cannot be fully understood without some reference to the question of getting a fair uh, economic deal uh, for ethnic minorities. In the case of India, I found that while regional disparities in general may simply be an extension of the wider problem of poverty, yet uh, two similarly placed states of comparable income may perceive their relative deprivation differently depending on their nationality status within the country. For instance, financial problems or uh, concerns of similar income states may be similar, but secessionist conflict arises only in those cases where these financial grievances overlap with the nationality structure. A closer look into the uh, empirical data shows that this happens for a reason. I do find a piece of clear evidence, which I will uh, briefly discuss in the course of my presentation, that uh, the national government policies do not seem to be promoting financial self-sufficiency of the minority dominated regions, especially the secessionist uh, ones among them but rather the attempt has been to keep them relatively more dependent on central finances and relatively less developed in comparison to these safer districts. These conclusions are based on my paired comparison of the economic trajectory of two rich states, one uh, non-secessionist, that is Haryana, and other secessionist, that is Punjab, and two poor states, one secessionist, that is Assam, and other non-secessionists, that is Bihar. I also compare Jammu Kashmir with Himachal Pradesh, both of which are adjoining states and both are characterized by hilly terrain. In other words, the persistence of regional disparities in countries like India might not simply be an extension of the problem of poverty. In some cases, the national ruling elite may actually be politically unwilling, not just incapable, of promoting uh, regional financial uh, self-sufficiency and might even be interested in orchestrating the uh, economic dependency of uh, secessionist regions. Indeed, when we look closely at the sequence of events from the origin of grievances to outbreak of secessionist crisis in Punjab, Assam, and Jammu and Kashmir, we find uh, that in all three cases, there was a perception of some sort of cultural domination, a fear created by the actions of the majority community dominating the national institutions and the policies of the central government uh, representing national majority. However, the perception of economic injustice often acts as the first catalyst, which politicizes the uh, suspicious or insecure ethnic minorities and propel them to seek institutional means for uh, the expression of their dissent and grievances. Uh, the case studies of secessionist movements in India show that it's only when state institutions and political processes fail to offer institutional channels for the expression of discontent that ethnic or religious minorities mobilize uh, to achieve their interests through violent means. This lesson is very clear from cases where conflict has been averted, for instance, in case of Tamils, 
the cases where it has been managed and even transformed, for instance, in case of Assam and Mizoram, and the cases where uh, the, the secessionist conflict has remained totally intractable, for instance, the ongoing conflict in Jammu and Kashmir. Therefore, institutional decay is the second catalyst in the overall chemistry of secessionist conflict. So this uh, is the second thesis that emerges from the experience of India. These two theses set the context for further deeper analysis. For instance, the overlap thesis tells us that financial uh, accommodation plays a critical role in diversity accommodation. And the twin catalyst thesis tells us that any fiscal approach to diversity accommodation will work only to the extent there are institutional channels for the expression of discontent. So now before we discuss uh, India's approach to fiscal accommodation of conflict and its success or failure, it's important to underline that India's uh, dominant strategy against violent secessionism has been military suppression of the conflict. This is because uh, advocacy of secessionism is unconstitutional and illegal in India. The tone for India's strategy for secessionist movements was set quite early in response to the Nagas movement for freedom, which had kicked off uh, before independence in 1929. Although Gandhi was uh, uh, in favor of the Nagas right to self-determination, Nehru opposed the idea on the grounds that it would set a precedent that could literally dissolve the new Indian state. Indeed, at the time of India's independence, the princely states of Hyderabad and Travancore attempted to secede. On the other hand, the Assamese, uh, the Mizos, and uh, the Tamils were also flirting with the idea of separatism. However, it was the Naga community that declared independence on the 14th of August, 1947 a day before India was to declare independence. Thereafter, the Nagaland church uh, conducted a plebiscite in May 1951, which recorded nearly unanimous vote uh, for independence. And by uh, 1956, an armed revolt started against India. The Indian government quickly reacted with all its military might and ruthlessly crushed the movement using the army, the air force, as well as its uh, paramilitary and local police. Finally, a ceasefire was negotiated in exchange for the formation of a new state within India. With this state of Nagaland, with extensive fiscal, legislative, and judicial autonomy was established on 1st of December, 1963. Therefore, the tone for India's strategy towards secessionist movements was set. The strategy was to combine a very brutal military suppression of secessionist violence with offers of concessions, provided the leaders of the movement keep the exit option off the negotiating table. Finally, the 42nd Amendment Act 1976 added the word integrity to the preamble in order to assert India's opposition to any threat that challenges its territorial integrity. Now I'll give you a brief uh, overview of uh, uh, India's fiscal constitution, which is important for understanding its role in diversity accommodation. As per the constitutional assignments of revenue raising powers and spending responsibilities, uh, the central government in India has access to uh, uh, most broad-based productive buoyant and elastic sources of revenues. However, subnational governments uh, have uh, responsibilities uh, to provide most of the economic and social services. This asymmetrical assignment of revenues and expenditure leads to vertical fiscal gap between the center and the states. Furthermore, there are wide, very wide economic disparities or horizontal imbalances uh, among the states. To deal with this situation, the Constitution of India provides for a comprehensive system of intergovernmental transfers. First of all, there is a provision for the appointment of the Finance Commission every five years to make recommendations on number one, 
uh, text evolution to states to fill the vertical system gap, and number two, grants in aid to cover the post-evolution deficits of the states. The aim of revenue sharing or unconditional transfers recommended by the Finance Commission is to enable all states to provide comparable levels of public services at comparable tax rates. Until 2015, there was, uh, there was a non-statutory body uh, called Planning Commission, which provided formula-based assistance to states for implementing development plans. After the abolition of the Planning Commission in 2015, there is no separate mechanism to provide financial assistance for the state plan schemes. Therefore, the Finance Commission from the uh, 14th uh, Finance Commission onwards are required to recommend uh, transfers for uh, uh, covering the entire revenue account expenditures of the states. Uh, in addition, the central ministries also provide financial assistance for uh, central welfare schemes at the state level. Some of these are fully funded and are called central sector schemes, while others are jointly funded by the center and the states and are called centrally sponsored schemes. These are completely discretionary and seek to ensure equalization of the expenditure levels of the states uh, in respect of specified services. Finally, there are various, uh, there are, uh, uh, various forms of uh, uh, ad hoc assistance uh, by the center to the states in form of grants and loans. In addition to these explicit sources of transfers, there are uh, uh, a variety of implicit sources of food, fuel, and fertilizer subsidies, subsidization of uh, public sector enterprises in the states, and uh, highly subsidized borrowings of the state governments from the banking sector, the uh, financial institution, and the central government itself. The analysis of various components of transfers show uh, that the general purpose transfers, which are recommended by the Finance Commission, are most equalizing whereas the specific uh, purpose transfers or the uh, schematic transfers uh, have a, a, a regressive bias, uh, which, is, which is not significant. The equalization effect of Finance Commission comes from uh, its formula for horizontal distribution, which, uh, which incorporates uh, uh, a mix of uh, variables uh, representing, yeah, uh, uh, revenue and cost uh, disabilities, as uh, it is clear from this uh, slide. Uh, notably, the uh, highest weightage is always given to the uh, income or, or the fiscal capacity of the states. Furthermore, uh, the uh, Finance Commission recommends the highest percentage of total transfers. So therefore, uh, the overall transfer system is quite equalizing with, with uh, elasticity coefficient of uh, minus 0 0.267. Overall, the fiscal federal structure in India is very well laid out. However, in terms of outcomes, the fiscal uh, federal institutions seem to have a limited practical impact. For instance, regional disparities have shown increasing trend uh, with the coefficient of variation in uh, per capita incomes increasing consistently over the years. Overall, as this figure shows, uh, the divergence of regional uh, economies is increasing over the years. Quite interestingly, the three secessionist regions of uh, Assam, Punjab, and Jammu and Kashmir are among the slowest growing economies. This is surprising because the low income states like Assam and Jammu and Kashmir are amongst the uh, highest recipients of tax shares and grants. This shows that even after the central transfers, low-income states with low revenue capacity spend significant lower per capita expenditures uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, social and economic services. This has implications for the secessionist movements in India, especially amongst the low income uh, and poor states because much of the literature on subject indicates that acute regional economic and income disparities can be a source of instability and unrest. 
In India, uh, if we see most of the economically based conflicts started uh, in mid-1960s when India's growth rate began to decline and revenue surplus of the center was no longer sufficient to plug uh, fiscal gaps at, at, at the subnational level. The conflicts deepened in the late, 90s, uh, in the late 1970s uh, when deficits appeared in the current accounts of both the center and the states. Center state conflicts further escalated in 1980s as the Indian economy uh, entered into a phase of crisis. The data suggests that there is a positive correlation between the inability of the center to support states finances to meet their expenditure obligations and rise of resentment in states against the center. In both uh, the, lo uh, the, the uh, low income states uh, of Assam, uh, and high-income state uh, of Punjab, the initial grievances were decidedly economic. The major grievance in Assam uh, was the immense lack of control of people of Assam over uh, their own land and natural resources. This grievance led to secessionist violence after 1985, intending to establish an independent sovereign state of Assam. They see the symptoms of colonial rule uh, in, in, in India's extractive interventions because it is their perception that India does not give back to the state a fair share of benefits from the resources extracted from their states. In Punjab, which is a, a high income state, the major grievance has been that despite Punjab being the breadbasket of the country, it does not get its fair share of the income generated by the state. Moreover, the central government exercises control over Punjab's river waters, agricultural prices, industrial policy, and development policies. Now, someone can argue that these are uh, uh, that uh, uh, there are economic issues and challenges within the country, but without any secessionist demand. The answer to this puzzle comes in the form of the case, which says that secessionism emerges only when economic and ethnic divides overlap with their attendant dynamics of interaction and uh, mutual reinforcement. In the Kashmir Valley, where uh, the uh, degree of ethnic uh, divide and polarization is high, the sentiment against the establishment emerged only because of the economic misgovernance of the state governments who were seen as the puppets of the Indian government. These union-backed state governments indulged in uh, a widespread corruption and nepotism and did not allow the policy benefits to, uh, to trickle down to the intended beneficiaries. Even when this overlap become, uh, became prominent, the secessionist violence emerged until the locals had tried and tested the existing institutional channels to direct their grievances. They even formed a political party and contested elections in 1987, in which they actually received widespread support, uh, but the elections were rigged. This slide uh, this slide uh, shows the statements of uh, two Kashmiris interviewed uh, by the uh, magazine of uh, one of the magazine of India, National Magazine, for today, in the aftermath of the rigged elections and the consequent disquiet, Kashmiris in general were shocked to find that the elections were rigged and the leaders they had supported uh, were not only declared defeated but falsely implicated and imprisoned. These defeated leaders then established two Islamist militant groups to whom Pakistan promptly provided full financial and moral support. So once the genie was out of the bottle, it was captured and controlled by Pakistan. So it would not, so, so uh, thereafter, it would not be put uh, uh, back in the bottle. Here comes the role of the twin catalyst thesis, uh, which focuses on fatal comp uh, combination of economic injustice and political disempowerment. This explanation is relevant in understanding the origins 
and trajectory of succession, uh, secessionism in Kashmir. Now, let us come to the question of suppression and concession to deal with secessionist crisis. As stated earlier, India's dominant strategy in mean, secessionism is to suppress uh, uh, all kind of uh, violence and terrorism by use of brutal military force and extend concessions only on the condition that uh, on only on the condition of uh, total allegiance to the uh, constitutionalism. The violent secessionist movement in Assam started in uh, the late 80s and intensified in the year 1990, but it was ruthlessly been to by launching two military operations, uh, the Operation Bajrang in 1990 and Operation Zainal in 1990. In January 1992, when the leaders and the cadres of the militant outfit surrendered, the government of India announced a few concessions such as uh, central assistance uh, for modernization of education in the state, uh, and state share in uh, uh, royal uh, royalties from oil, plywood, and tea. And, uh, State. Before we look into the data to confirm whether the promise was kept or not, uh, let us have a quick look at the trajectory of uh, conflict in Punjab. The violent secessionist movement in Punjab started in early 80s, and the Indian state responded with all its brutal might, launching a ferocious crackdown on Sikh militants and their sympathizers. In 1985, the central government decided to concede most of the demands of the moderate leaders of the Akali Dal. Therefore, concessions were offered in, in, in the form of Punjab Accord, which was signed between Akali leader uh, Longowal and Rajiv Gandhi, the then Prime Minister of India, uh, on 24 July 1985. However, the accord was not acceptable to the extremists and militants who wanted complete independence. Therefore, they assassinated Longowal within, within one month uh, after the accord and initiated a deadly militant movement. As expected, the response was even more brutal state action. The policy was simply to catch and kill. Thousands of innocents were killed during these ruthless operations. But by the end of 1993, terrorism was literally torn out by the roots. The Punjab's Director General of Police, Mr. Gill's hard-hitting and merciless approach totally eradicated the leaders as well as the cadres. The operation was such that all leaders and cadres of the militant Khalistan movement were killed. So the Sikhs lost their bargaining power almost completely. Therefore, no formal institutional accommodation of the Sikh demand took place. Even the Rajiv Longowal Accord, which is still believed to be the uh, key to a dispute resolution in Punjab was never revived again, and the concessions related to increased autonomy, river water sharing, transfer of uh, Chandigarh to Punjab, etc., were not granted. And yet, the movement ended almost permanently. Now, let me show how differently Indian fiscal federal system has responded to three secessionist movements. Chan uh, Professor Chanchal, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you still have a couple of minutes left. Sorry for this. I, I, I'll, I'll okay. finish uh, within, uh, I think. Uh, sorry again. Uh, I, I knew all the time. Uh, but uh, first, uh, let us have a look at the structure of their finances in uh, one graph. Uh, as this graph illustrates, Punjab raises more than 70% of revenues from its own resources, whereas Assam and Jammu and Kashmir raise 25 to 30% uh, from uh, their own revenues. This reflects Punjab's high income status and also shows a uh, high level of revenue mobilization by Punjab in comparison to uh, other two states. With regard to financial assistance to these states, I find that Assam's share in, in, in uh, 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 transfers increased rapidly after the conflict in the state ended, indicating a rise in financial rewards for appeasement to satisfy the economic demands of the secessionists. Punjab, however, has not been uh, fortunate. The uh, reason is that the central government had no incentive to offer concessions. Why? Because number one, the movement was thoroughly crushed, and number two, it had no external support 
to uh, maintain or revive, uh, revive uh, insurgency. To be sure, Pakistan did support the movement for a few years, but then decided to focus more on Kashmir, where it had higher stakes. Therefore, the alleged uh, uh, economic discrimination against Punjab continues uh, and has even worsened after the uh, war against militants was uh, won by the uh, state decisively. The approach here has, uh, in this case of Punjab, seems to be of financial retribution rather than reward. What lent support to this uh, uh, financial retribution thesis in case of Punjab is the fact that the break appears at around 1992-93 when militancy was successfully eradicated. Additionally, when we compare Punjab with the neighboring state of Haryana, both of which came into existence in 1965 after partition of former state of East Punjab, we uh, find support for uh, the allegation of the uh, leaders of Punjab movement there that there had been an attempt to keep the state industrially backward. Uh, this is clear from the data where we observe whether we observe uh, 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 industrial production or capital outlay. Let us now observe some statistics of Kashmir. Kashmir is a curious case of a genie that escaped the border in 1989 due to one major blunder of the uh, central and state governments of the time, that is massive rigging of the state election in 1987. Since then, there have been many attempts to force and cajole uh, the Gini back in bottle, but the crisis remains intractable. Let us see how the data looks like. First of all, financial bounty to the state appears enormous by all standards and comparison. The graph do show that financial assistance did increase after secessionist crisis broke out. However, in terms of economic outcomes, the data paints a bleak picture. The, this case is full of contradictions. For instance, uh, although Assam receives high financial support, uh, from the center, just like Assam does. Uh, uh, yet the uh, debt GDP ratio uh, of uh, Kashmir is as high as that of Punjab. This indicates uh, that uh, in case of Jammu and Kashmir, the outlays are similar to and even more than the case of Assam, whereas outcomes are uh, similar to and even worse than Punjab. In other words, outlays are not translating into outcomes. For instance, if we compare Jammu Kashmir with the, with the neighboring state of uh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, uh, which like Jammu and Kashmir has hilly and difficult terrain, it is surprising to note that uh, the gap between Jammu and Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh in terms of the uh, number of factory units has expanded immensely since the outbreak of conflict. Similarly, uh, the share of industrial production in Jammu and Kashmir and STP, uh, net state domestic product, is declining, although uh, it was much higher than uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh before the secessionist uh, crisis began. Overall, let me conclude uh, uh, the major findings by saying that lack of fiscal equalization does create anxiety, fear, and insecurity in the low income states, whereas the excess of fiscal equalization has a similar demoralizing effect on the high income states. This finding is subject to the presence of the ethnic economic overlap and the perception of deprivation and disempowerment among the ethnic minorities. I have encapsulated these two preconditions for the rise of violent secessionism in the form of the overlap thesis and twin catalyst thesis respectively. It also emerges from my uh, research that the center has uh, the room to maneuver via concessions only until military confrontation escalates. Once military suppression starts, it tends to boost the very forces that it uh, uh, seeks to suppress. And secessionist crisis enters a vicious cycle of reinforcement. However, in certain situations, the use of brutal force can actually weaken secessionist forces. This situation arises when, when militants lose support from their own community and receive negligible support from, from the external powers. Under these conditions, the national army and police get a winning edge and militancy is suppressed. However, this situation, it seems, reduces incentives for the center to offer concessions, which are typically offered only in the exchange for uh, giving up the armed movement and demands uh, for uh, secession. So these are my findings so far. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks for the patience. Thank you so much, Professor Chanchar Kumar Sharma for this very interesting presentation that really gives the idea of how diversity is somehow the rule in India instead of the exception. So uh, I will leave comments for 
um, the, the, the last part of the workshop. And now I immediately pass the floor to the last but not least speaker of this morning, Professor Solomon Negus. Uh, he will uh, have a, a presentation on fiscal fairs and diversity accommodation in Ethiopia. Uh, a couple of words on uh, Professor Negus. Um, he's professor and dean of the College of Law and Governance Studies of Addis Abeba University, and he is member of the Center for Federal Studies at the same university. He is consulted to international and national organization and has been a research fellows at the Institute of Federalism of the University of Freiburg and at the Alabama Law School. And among others, he's an expert on intergovernmental financial relations in diverse society. So Professor Negussi, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Alice. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. Can you turn a bit? Um, can you switch the volume a bit higher, please? Oh, the, the mic? Yeah, the microphone. Okay. Can you hear him? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? I cannot hear very well oh. uh, in between. It's It's... It would be better if you could be a bit higher, the volume. OK, I was here using headphone. Now it's much better. OK, can you hear me? Yeah. If you can talk loud, it helps anyway. Okay. Well, maybe I have to switch off. Sorry, can you hear me? Let me see. Hello? No, okay, it's fine. Can you hear me, Alice? We can hear you. Uh, okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it is uh, very early, it's around 5 a.m., so sometimes I may lose focus because I was traveling these uh, few days. Anyway, <clears throat> my presentation will focus on a country which is struggling to build a sustainable uh, fiscal constitution and even uh, establishing a viable political environment to implement a meaningful uh, federal system. Uh, my presentation will have three parts. The first one is in the form of introduction to give you a general, uh, a very brief uh, information about the federal setup in Ethiopia. And the second part focuses on the pillars of fiscal federalism and uh, its implementation uh, in the form of general perspectives. And the final one tries to relate on whether fiscal federalism uh, enhances diversity accommodation or faces some challenges uh, because of uh, the practice on the ground. Uh, let me come back to the first part on the introduction. It's important to note that uh, Ethiopia, with an estimated population of more than 100 million, has nowadays has 11 states, member states, and two uh, city administrations. Uh, initially, we had nine states, but recently, in 2019 and 2021, we have added two uh, more states and totally we have uh, 11 states. Uh, the federal arrangement, as you may have uh, noticed in your earlier uh, introduction to the Ethiopian system, 
it is mainly built on the uh, uh, ethno-national uh, uh, movements and questions in Ethiopia. So the constitution focuses on guaranteeing the rights of nations, nationalities, or people as it is described in the constitution, but which mainly focuses on rights of ethnic groups. And because of that, the Ethiopian constitution has some distinct features because it focuses on the self-determination of every nation and nationality, including the right to secede. And this has also introduced, the constitution has also introduced some unique features by recognizing the sovereignty rights of these uh, groups, the nations or nationalities or the ethnic groups, and by establishing a second chamber with a unique form of uh, 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 membership and power. And the second chamber, what we call the House of Federation in Ethiopia, has a representation for each and every uh, uh, ethnic group identified, more than 70 ethnic groups identified uh, in the country. And the House has also uh, a constitutional interpretation power. And the other important power is to determine the sharing of revenue and the allocation of grants to the constituency. These are important features because as we are going to go deep into the analysis, has its own implication on the viability of the federal identity. But to begin with, you can see uh, the constituent units have huge asymmetry. Although the constitution gives symmetrical power distribution between the uh, states, all states, but in fact, there is a de facto asymmetry, as you can see, where one of the states constitutes more than one third of the total population. And in terms of size, it also constitutes one fifth of the total size of the state, the, the, the country. And whereas we have also a state where uh, zero point, uh, around 0.2 percent of the total population, and it is a kind of with the small uh, territorial uh, areas, it's a kind of city states in the country. And in total, we have three, two states which constitute more than 45% of the total population of the country and constituting two thirds of the territory of the country. So you can assume the asymmetry that we can we observe uh, uh, in, in, in those 11 states. And also the, the, the practice identifies uh, relatively developed advanced states and relatively uh, less developed uh, emerging states where the constitution also guarantees uh, a fair distribution of resources to those emerging states. And visibly you can see the disparity in their revenue sources, in their natural resource endowments, and, 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 and uh, the skilled laborers, and uh, the administrative capacities, and so on. So you can see these important factors in the federal arrangement. And of course, the uh, Ethiopia follows uh, a parliamentary system, so that you, that has its own implication on the functioning of the ruling party in the federal as well as in the uh, state's uh, level. The constitution divides power between the states and the federal government, reserving residual powers to the states. And it also divides the taxing powers between the federal and the state government uh, under uh, its own constitution. And this uh, constitutional arrangement has also introduced some unique features as we are going to dip into the uh, constitution, the relevant provisions of the constitution. Uh, when we see the, 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 the expenditure responsibilities coming to the, uh, the fiscal constitution and those expenditure tax transfers and so on in the constitutional and practical aspect, the constitution enumerates in detail the federal powers but in general provides the state's power under its constitution. 
therefore the states have the right to establish their own administration to enact their own constitutions to formulate regional economic and social development policies to administer land and natural resources based on the federal legislations and to enact their own tax laws although as we are going to see uh, uh, there is a solid harmony between the federal and the state tax laws and uh, uh, that harmonization somehow undermines the tax competition among the constituent units. And uh, states have also their own right to enact uh, the uh, law pertaining to the civil service and to establish their own uh, state police force. And not only state police force, these days one of the problematic area is to have their own special paramilitary forces, which led to uh, serious catastrophic uh, <clears throat> and instability uh, using those special forces uh, among the neighboring territories in the northern and southern parts of the country. Coming to the tax assignments, the constitution provides federal and state taxes. It doesn't talk about the local tax power. And uh, the federal tax power mainly, as you can see, those international trade taxes and this interstate uh, business activities, uh, and interstate transport activities, and exclusively the tax power for the federal government is enumerated under Article 96 of the Constitution. Similarly, Exclusive tax powers for the states are also enumerated under Article 97 of the Constitution. But there is also an important package which talks about the concurrent, or sometimes we call it the joint tax sources for the federal government in the state, which is now emerging as the most important revenue source for the states as well. So constitutionally speaking, it is not unilaterally owned by the federal or the state uh, government, but the administration and the lawmaking power is reserved to the state. There are some legal issues on, on the concurrent taxation power enumerated in the constitution. And the constitution, because of the unique approach that it follows, as, as you may have read the Ethiopian constitution, it lists the source of taxes and also the the base and the types of taxes by dividing to the states, the federal government, and the concurrent power of taxes. Therefore, any source or any type of tax which may be introduced is subject to the constitutional provision under Article 99, which is uh, uh, identified as undesignated tax sources, and it has to be decided by uh, the joint meeting of the federal and the state lawmaking. Therefore, that uniqueness is, is uh, or ha has having its own impact on the introduction of new tax bases as well as new tax systems. And also, the Constitution under Article 100 leads to uh, introduce uniformity instead of tax competition. There are some vague constitutional provisions which enhances tax harmonization in the state. As you can see here on the table, uh, you, you can see uh, the division of uh, taxes and sources exclusively to the federal or to the state or to be shared between the federal government and the states in the form of revenue sharing. So custom belongs to the federal government, income tax, as you can see, there are federal and state, as well as those sources which is uh, to be shared between the federal government and the state. You can also see VAT and turnover taxes, excise taxes to be shared between the federal government and the states because those types of taxes levied from incorporated or, or registered companies uh, to be shared through the uh, revenue sharing arrangements, which I will talk a little bit later. So uh, to look into some of the figures, the federal government generates revenue, significant amount of revenue from custom taxes and charge sports and exports, and it contributes a significant amount around 5% of its revenue. And also revenue is generated from the concurrent taxes in the form of value added tax, in the form of company profit tax, and in the form of uh, uh, fees and charges to the federal government as well as to the state. And these are significant sources 
problem to this paper, to the paper Gabon. Uh, you can also see uh, uh, the states, although they have some tax, uh, 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 taxing power on, uh, on those sources, which I mentioned earlier, but the capacity is very much limited to those sources which are uh, attached to the payroll taxes, which are attached to individual traders, which are attached to the collection of fees and charges. Uh, uh, oh, and it's significant amount of revenue is not generated from agricultural taxes, uh, land use fees, and so on, because of various reasons as, as we are going to see capacity and uh, uh, the volatility of these uh, tax sources in the economy and uh, 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 and uh, uh, the conflicting interests of, of the local authorities, the state authorities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the federal uh, directive. So as you can see, over the years, uh, states were able to generate able to generate around, not more than some data show around 22, 25%, but in general, not more than 25% of their share. And uh, that accounts only uh, for, for percent of ger general expenditure. Uh, and the remaining amount comes uh, through transfers from uh, the federal government. Therefore, as you can see here, the data varies over the years, starting from 1995 up to 2020. Sometimes the states generate around 15%, sometimes they generate around 25% in total. But what is visible is that the revenue generating capacity of the states as well as the federal government in Ethiopia is below the African standard, which uh, for sub-Saharan African countries is around 17% of the GDP but we are uh, way below uh, the 15 percent of the gdp uh, 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 that the government is introducing various reform programs to uh, uh, reach that target by uh, 2025 the 17 percent target therefore we observed significant fiscal imbalance between the federal government and the states as we call it the vertical gap as well as the horizontal one among the constituent units. There are states which generate less than 10% of their uh, expenditure, and there are also states which generate more than 25%, and even two of the states uh, have been generating between 35 to 45 to 40% of their expenditure. And this is expected to be addressed through the various transfer mechanisms. And in Ethiopia, coming to the uh, transfer mechanisms, there are general and conditional grants, conditional grants, and also the sharing of revenue generated from those concrete taxes, as I said, administered by the federal government, but decided by the second chamber, the uh, House of Federal. And the intergovernmental transfer is according to the constitution, which emphasizes on equitable transfer, equitable share of resources. The House of Federation gives emphasis to designing a grant formula or the sharing of revenue formula, which emphasizes uh, the uh, principle of equalization so that the horizontal, uh, as the horizontal imbalance can be narrowed down uh, uh, through this intervention mechanism, as you can see. Here we have important constitutional pr principles uh, which emphasize on allocating uh, uh, resources equitably among the federal government and the states as well as uh, between among the states. Uh, to give a, a summary of the uh, share of revenue, you can see here uh, the state share, the federal share, and uh, uh, the overall state's capacity in generating revenue uh, uh, compared to the total national revenue in the country. You can see if we include uh, 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 as, as a, a, a constituent unit, the capital city generating its own revenue, 
you can see that all states, including Addis Ababa, they generate 23.81% of the total expenditure. Otherwise, if we exclude Addis Ababa, that may go up because uh, the, it's Addis Ababa has a significant expenditure uh, task, and then the states will have 40% of the total expenditure. And you can see from 1995 up to 2020, the uh, general grant allocated by the federal government have been revised 10 times. And uh, since 2012, the uh, grant allocation formula has been revised to focus on both the revenue uh, generating capacity of the states and uh, the uh, common expenditure needs of the states to give meaning to the equalization effort of the uh, uh, grant formula uh, uh, in, in introduced by the House of Federation. The House of Federation has no capacity to design the grant formula, but employs experts to design this formula so that uh, the basic uh, uh, criteria laid down by the Constitution to be followed by the experts and emphasized on equalization among the constituent units. In addition to the general unconditional grant, the federal government has various conditional grants, but the House of Federation urges the federal government to follow the share uh, determined by the general uh, grants to determine the share of states getting access to this uh, conditional grant. But there are also conditional grants which are not uh, properly addressed through the sharing determined by the House of Federation because of uh, various reasons that each ministries may introduce different programs, each uh, regional government have partnership with, with, with uh, bilateral donor uh, countries and international institutions. So we cannot say everything is included here, but those programs initiated by the federal government are uh, uh, allocating conditional grants supervised by the Federal Ministry of Finance uh, for its proper implementation. For example, the road fund, uh, the safety net program, the urban safety net program, the general education quality improvement program, the urban local, these are programs which allocate funding for the states for specific programs as determined by uh, the federal government. The other transfer instrument is the revenue sharing arrangement, which has been neglected for many years, but now emerging as a very good source for the state. Revenue sharing, those taxes collected, those re the revenue collected under the concurrent taxation power listed under Article 98 of the Constitution. Constitutionally, both the federal government and the states have right to share the revenue based on the formula introduced by the House of Federation. That is the second chart. Here uh, you can see the formula was introduced in 2003, although the constitution was introduced in 1995, the House of Federation introduced in 2003, but it was implemented not as expected as desired by the constitution. Therefore, you can see uh, the contribution of uh, the sharing of revenue from concurrent taxes for the states was not more than 10% uh, of their total revenue. But in 2021, we are expecting a data which increases that percentage significantly to 25% of their share. And we are, we are waiting for the official data from uh, the Ministry of Revenue. But the initial report shows that the states are expected to have a significant share from, from that. And secondly, we have to note that this formula mainly focuses on uh, the equalization principle, for example, uh, from uh, royal, for example, from royalty, the royalty revenue is to be shared not only between the producing states and the federal government, but states which are not producing natural resource exploration have the right to share 
40 uh, percent of the reality on equalization principle and uh, reduce the producing states get 20 uh, percent and the local government get 10 to 10 percent of that similarly on the value added tax uh, 50 percent in the new formula we are expecting 50 percent of the value added tax to be shared uh, between the federal government and the state and from this 50 percent 25 percent goes based on the uh, uh, derivative principle but the remaining 25 percent is to be shared based on equalization principle as determined in the grant formula with the state so this is uh, uh, an effort to enhance uh, uh, the principle of uh, uh, accommodation of diversity and narrowing the gap between the states and ensuring comparable levels of services in all the constituent units in, in the country. As a final remark, this effort at the federal level to allocate resources among the constituent units, that means the federal the, the state and the federal government, the uh, states are also expected to introduce allocation of grants based on equalization principle to subnational level, to local government, district level. This has been implemented in, 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 in the states, but uh, assessments made at subnational level is not as such encouraging because uh, except municipalities, local governments do not have uh, the taxing power. Uh, all the revenue comes in the form of grants and the formulas that are designed by uh, the states are uh, usually uh, challenged by uh, local government. But, but still, we appreciate that they are trying to make the transfer of revenue from the states to local government in a, a, a somehow transparent mode. Now, the final part, the issue is whether fiscal federalism enhances accommodation uh, 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 through the mechanisms that we have been uh, discussing earlier. Well, I see it from different perspectives. From a historical perspective, very uh, the, the, the 20th century history of the country shows that until 1991, the country was passing through uh, a strong uh, centralized system and especially uh, from 1974 to that of 1991, the military junta was following a highly centralized system and the introduction of a federal arrangement in post-1991 period has somehow uh, decentralized government functions, revenue sources, and introduced the sharing of revenue uh, in the governing laws, either in the transitional charter as well as in the uh, federal constitution. Therefore, introducing fiscal federalism as a form of enhancing self-governance, self-rule at state and sub-state level, and all uh, the sharing of national revenue generated either by the federal government or in the form of concurrent taxes to be shared with the state is a mechanism for ensuring uh, accommodation of diversity. Therefore, this intervention in post-1991 can be considered as, as a means to ensure this commitment. And also, establishing these uh, two houses is a means for ensuring representation of the constituent units at the federal level, at the national level, so that they can also determine the sharing of revenue, they can also participate in the lawmaking process themselves. Although the second chamber has no legislative power in, uh, in parallel with the lower uh, uh, The implementation of the allocation of grants and the devolution of power can also be considered as uh, uh, a reflection of this commitment to accommodation of diversity. But there are also serious challenges which we have witnessed recently in, in, in post-2012 uh, election in the country and also the, 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 the practice. But I can list some of these challenges. Accommodation of diversity is somehow, I would say, is challenged 
because of the defects of the birth of the federal system in, in 1991, in 1992, because the Ethiopian constitution, uh, starting from the transition of the charter in 1992, talks about self-rule and shared rule, and the self-rule recognizes the constitutional right to secede to every nation, nationality, or in short, for many audiences to uh, ethnic group. This is one of the challenges that uh, any, any uh, 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 sovereign unit in the country can easily invoke this constitutional right, although in practice that's not uh, easy to implement, but it is a means for negotiating at the House of Federation. And the other is the over-centralization of the, the uh, ruling parties at the federal level and at state, at state level, because we have witnessed over the, for, for the last three decades that power is centralized by a single and the sole uh, ruling party at the federal and the state level. And we have also witnessed the political tension because of this lack of political pluralism in the country that uh, over centralization has led us to the uh, conflict as many have uh, witnessed on post-2017 uh, political situation in the country. The other is the governance problem that we witness. Although the formulas, although the constitutional designs, although the, uh, all the mechanisms that I tried to briefly present talk about equalization, talk about proportional development, talk about fair distribution of resources and so on. This cannot be a mechanism to ensure that citizens at states and sub-state level are reaping the benefits of decentralization because of uh, corruption, because of maladministration, because of uh, lack of fiscal discipline, because of uh, abuse of government resources. People have been crying for fair implementation of decentralization at all levels because that might have led to income inequality at household level, that might have led to uh, inequality even among the state because some were properly utilizing their resources and some were failing to properly utilize and there no institutional mechanism, a meaningful institutional mechanism to curb these maladministrations at state and local level. These have been the cases that led to the public discontent and uh, uh, the uh, uh, political unrest in post-2012 election. Therefore, uh, this have uh, led uh, to some of the political rhetorics to talk about cessation, to talk about, you know, uh, call for a more uh, regional uh, autonomy, a more regional self-administration and so on. So this the public discontent can, if that cannot be timely and efficiently addressed, might lead to a cessation of the, the tendencies, might lead to political arrests, might lead to an uncharted, you know, political uh, 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 experiences in the country. This is one of the effects which we witness uh, the, the, uh, the public discontents in Oromia, in Amhara, which discouraged investment in those regions for the last three, four years. And the other is because of the political culture that we developed, a ruling party, a, a coalition of the ruling party, which lost its place at the federal level, have now become a strong challenger to the very survival of the nation itself, as you might have seen the war between the federal government and uh, uh, the Tigray state. And uh, uh, this is mainly, the political unrest is mainly related to uh, the behavior of the states at the federal, the government at the uh, federal level, which somehow controls, somehow uh, infiltrates on the economy, on the governance at the, uh, every level and uh, uh, somehow restricting the political accountability at all levels and uh, 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 
somehow uh, uh, giving less meaning to the constitutional principles of transparency, public participation, and legal accountability promised in the constitution. Therefore, those government efforts have not been fully appreciated by the public and led to those discontents that we have been facing and still continue to face for the last five years. And this is also uh, reflected in uh, the administrative capacity of the state because of you know the reasons that I said earlier, the lack of uh, accountability and so might be the reflection of lack of capacity and governing at the state and, and, and sub-state level. Therefore, as a final uh, input, uh, we can consider uh, some issues which may enhance the strong uh, uh, implementation of the accommodation of diversity, somehow addressing the governance problems that we witness, somehow addressing the issues pertaining to uh, fiscal federalism, which led to the centralization of power at the federal level, and somehow strengthening the institutional designs as promised in the constitution to make it meaningful for fiscal decentralization to play its role. And also the political aspect, <laughs> the fiscal federalism cannot simply uh, survive on a vacuum unless the political stability, the political structure, and the political actors have uh, played their role in a meaningful way. Therefore, that stabilizing the political situation in the country has its own meaning on uh, the uh, fiscal uh, federalism playing its significant role so that building confidence for the states that they are part and parcel of the uh, sharing of benefits and burdens in the country. So these are some of uh, the input, the interventions for improving uh, the uh, uh, role of fiscal federalism in enhancing uh, uh, regional integration into the commitments of uh, the federal uh, constitution. This is a work in progress and simply to share some of my thoughts and I hope this will be improved through the Q and A session. Thank you very much and back to you, Ali. Thank you very much. Oops, I raised my hand by mistake. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Solomon, for this um, very interesting presentation on Ethiopia. And I think now we can move to the question period. We already have uh, three questions in the in the chat, and I'm sure well I have also some. I'm sure Alicia will have some as well. And uh, I think we have uh, first uh, th um, two questions for Professor David Bell. The first one by Ana Herrera Alcalde from the Open University in Madrid. Um, that uh, she indeed asked that if after the devolution of the personal income tax, she wants to know what's happening with the visibility of devolved governments, if, uh, if, if the population is aware of this uh, shift in uh, tax responsibility. And there is also a question about the impact that Brexit had on uh, Northern Ireland, and especially if the... Um, regarding the relations between the government in, in, in Belfast and the government in, in London, and if there are different attitudes regarding this, this relationship between the nationalist and unionist, uh, and unionist parties. Um, I also wanted to ask one question to, to, to Professor Bell, especially about um, uh, the Barnett formula and the and the 115th uh, flaw that was introduced to to uh, in re regarding to Wales, and if uh, this flaw would uh, help to have a bigger uh, convergence uh, between Wales and the rest of the, uh, especially England and the rest of the of the United Kingdom, if we can see a 
equalizing effect embedded in this uh, flow that was applied to, to, to Wales, which I think is not planned, uh, it's only planned for Wales, it's not, it's not, not going to be uh, planned for, for Scotland in the, in the future. Okay, well, thank you. That's that's a few questions. I, if I take that last one, um, essentially, what 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 we've got is is a floor on the uh, Barnet grant that can be given that is given to Wales, and the reason for that was that the 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 amounts given to the different parts of the UK. Um, actually reflected a rough assessment of need way back in 1979. And the different parts of the UK fared differently since then. And, and if, if, you, if you follow the way the formula works, it's still partly dependent on where, on the, on the 1979 situation. And Wales was the one part that seemed to suffer differentially badly as a result of the Barnett formula. And as such, an ad hoc adjustment was made and, and, and the UK works with many, many, many ad hoc adjustments. Um, whether, so th this was effect effectively to, to protect Wales and public spending in Wales um, because Barnett wasn't sufficiently generous to it. Um, I it's difficult to know what the political reaction to that has been. I think a, a grudging acceptance, uh, uh, a welcoming of the that decision, but um, uh, that hasn't stopped Wales from becoming more uh, aware of its own identity and, and more willing to assert its... Um, a, in, well, not independence, but 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 uh, its distinctiveness from from England, which which given that Wales is is really the most proximate uh, of the three uh, nations to England, that this that this is an interesting development. Um, the 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 question about income tax is an interesting one. It's. Uh, I didn't go fully into the detail. Let me just uh, say a couple of things. One is that Scotland can control the bans and um, allowing the the rates and the and the bans for income tax. It doesn't actually collect the tax. Uh, it's still the UK government that collects the tax, and the and the UK government also sets personal allowances. Now everyone has to declare whether they are a Scottish taxpayer or not. So that is that is one element of the visibility. But the the differences that have been made so far in the in the bans and rates, uh, as far as uh, uh, it, you know, the contrast between Scotland and and England in terms of uh, income tax rates and bans are quite small, partly because of a, of a concern that you will end up uh, a deterring people from migrating to Scotland or possibly also get uh, a causing uh, people to move their tax affairs to England and there are ways of doing that. So the visibility of all of this isn't that high, to be honest. So, you know, there's a question about whether all of the extra administration has been worth it, but that's that's the current uh, 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 position. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of all of the changes that have been made, Whereas in Scotland in particular, the Nationalist Party made huge claims that if they got the fiscal tools, they could produce much better economic outcomes. Um, now that they have some of these tools, this um, the claims are, are not are have gone quiet. Uh, and there's no real evidence of the use of the of the new fiscal powers to any massive extent. I mean, there there are some differences that they've they've done with welfare payments, some differences on on property taxes, but but the overall changes haven't been huge. And and all of this discourse, it seems to me, uh, is. Uh, 
completely flies under the radar. It, it doesn't, you know, most of the population aren't really aware of the nuances of fiscal federalism and what differences uh, um, changes in, uh, in in fiscal structure might be making, although, although, the, although they're, uh, you know, they have made claims in the past that, that it, it's a sort of simple uh, line from increased fiscal powers to better economic outcomes. I don't think that is, is, uh, is a sort of slogan that, um, uh, the secessionist parties are paying so much attention to because once you get you get stuck into the detail of all of this, I think the public loses interest in it to some to some extent. A the Northern Ireland question, Northern Ireland still uh, being um, a. a uh, it's still part of the Barnett formula as far as uh, finances is, is concerned. It's very generous, as I showed in, in one of the previous slides. So that hasn't, um, the, the Brexit and the fact that Northern Ireland is still within the single market hasn't affected the financing arrangements as far as Northern Ireland are concerned, or not in any very significant way. Um, the both parties continue, so both the nationalist and the unionist parties continue to uh, uh, expect Westminster to uh, maintain a high level of support uh, uh, through their through the block grant uh, system. Um, what where when they are where they are successful in extracting more concessions which are usually in the form of additional finance, is where the party in power in Westminster needs the votes of the, of the Northern Irish, usually the Unionists, in order to um, uh, pass some, some, some piece of legislation. And in Mrs May, the previous Prime Minister's time, uh, the, uh, the Unionists were, were successful in so doing. And have, um, you know, arguably the most generous settlement of of any part of of the United Kingdom, but it's usually a political driver rather than an economic one that 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 has worked in their favour uh, uh, most recently. And the current situation is the status quo as far as the Barnett formula is concerned. Hope that does that answer them all. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you also from Anna's side. She would she would all thank you in the in the chat as all well. Right, okay. <laughs> and we also have a question for Professor Sanders uh, about the impact that the demands of New South Wales had in the system, uh, especially if the federal government has been more sensitive to these than to those coming from other less populated parts of the country. And I think Alicia uh, wants a follow up on that. Yeah, can I ask something before you answer? So maybe you can answer both because it's related. Well, not not to the same case, but I wonder if uh, because you mentioned that Western Australia uh, signed a side deal um, to the to the intergovernmental agreement related to equalization, and I wonder, well, first of all, if it's a formal deal that has been signed and it's written down on paper, or is just an informal agreement. And uh, the second thing is if this uh, side deal and has something to do with the reform that was approved in 2018 that moved equalization from full to reasonable equalization. If I wonder if the Western Australia was the one that uh, pressed for this change and eventually things changed after or will change after this uh, new deal will enter into force. Mm. Uh, on both those things, uh, I need to do a little bit more work on on this. I I, I believe the, the the deal with Western Australia was a written deal which went for five years, and I suspect it is behind the review of relativities and the move to um, from full to partial. Um, but I, I'm I need to do a bit more work on that uh, at this point. 
on the issue about New South Wales generally, um, if you compare my slides, basically um, New South Wales ha ha currently has 32% of the population and it gets about 29% of the revenue share under the general revenue sharing uh, for for the goods and services tax. So they pay a 3% sort of levy, <laughs> which um, because they're a third of the nation, and basically th that can is enough to top up the, the, the other states like Tasmania and Northern Territory, which are the ones that have the high relativities um, each year. Um, I, I think the way I understand it, basically, the Commonwealth Grants Commission is fairly has always been fairly sympathetic to the small state claims of, um, uh, but um, in recent and traditionally, Commonwealth Treasury would defend the sort of per capita uh, position. So I think you, you, New South Wales gets defended by the underlying uh, sense that anything that moves away from per capita needs to be justified. And Treasury's done that, Commonwealth Treasury has done that for them. And I think, as I, and I need to do a bit more on this, on this that, that New South Wales has made submissions in that, in a, that defence as well in recent years where it used not to, it used to just rely on the Commonwealth Treasury to do it for it. Um, but yes, so I think the common the New South Wales probably has taken a, a bit of a more active role in recent years, defending per capita grants uh, or or um, not moving too too much further away from them. Uh, but I, again, I need to do a bit more more work on that. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw that we have another question regarding uh, Ethiopia uh, about the concurrency of taxation powers, about how they work, if the subnational governments have the full power to design the tax, or if it's like in other countries where they can only change uh, the rate of the tax, or in, 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 in a certain manner, if, or, or if it's merely a uh, um, tax revenue sharing, as, as for example, in, in other in other models here in Europe. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is. It is a question which is raised uh, often. Uh, the title of the Constitution, which says "concurrent taxation," is misleading as it appears uh, in, the, in the Constitution because. The, the details of the constitutional provision do not give you clearly the uh, ordinary meaning of concurrency as we have with, as we uh, often uh, observe in developed federations. That means uh, the states do not have uh, the power to set uh, the rate, to determine the base, and to unilaterally decide on, on those sources mentioned uh, under the concurrent taxation. Therefore, in effect, it is a provision which entitles the states to share the revenue from the sources mentioned under the concurrent taxation. So uh, the states do not have the full, power, the full power to determine the base, the rate, and to give other benefits to the taxpayers in addition to the federal tax powers. It's not the case. It's the ordinary meaning of revolution. But it is different from other uh, devolved or federal systems. That means it is not unilaterally decided by the federal government. It has to be decided by the second chamber, the rate for the federal government in the states, the, uh, how much goes to the state and how much the states, each state get the share from that revenue collected under the concurrent tax power is determined by the second chamber. Uh, the federal government's role is to come up with the legislation, determining the rate, determining the basis, and the mode of collection and other benefits in consultation with the house of the second chamber and the lower house which enacts the legislation. Uh, and, and if we see it in the recent developments, initially it was considered as a federal tax, 
since 1995 to that of uh, 2018, the tendency was to consider it as a federal tax. Therefore, it is simply uh, pulled to the uh, revenue allocated in the form of grant subsidy to the state. But since 2018, we have made a revision saying that the constitution doesn't talk about uh, revenue collected under uh, the concurrent taxation to be included uh, uh, in the ordinary uh, grant uh, subsidy allocation to the state. So, so separate criteria are included, justifications are attached, and the rates are determined by the second chamber, where the states, some of the states were even claiming 90% of the revenue to go to the states where natural resources are exploited. That means there was a serious negotiation to reduce that rate to that of 60%. Therefore, it is uh, an ordinary revenue sharing arrangement, but with its unique feature. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we can, we have just two last questions. I'll, uh, I think Alice has a question on India, and I yes. will also take the opportunity to ask uh, one, la one last question about the United Kingdom and about yeah. the, the um, Internal Market Act. And I would like to know if Professor Bell thinks that this can transform into a kind of spending power for, for, the, for the Westminster government to spend on devolved areas. Something like we have seen a trend, we have seen, for example, in Canada for, for many years. But also, Alicia, we can collect your question on, on India at the same time. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Francisco. So my question on India, uh, first one is a clarification because I've understood well that um, secessionist state after or, or during the secessionist claim or the secession movement, they do receive an increase in transfer or have understood uh, it wrong and eventually do they again decrease? But my, my question was related to something different anyhow, because as far as I've understood, uh, states do not have a role in the decision-making process related to the equalization mechanism. So with the exception of the Finance Commission, it's the union government that have the, um, the dominance in this field. But I wonder if other issues uh, or other informal instruments are in place to influence the decision. I'm thinking about, for instance, political party affiliation. So states which have the same political party affiliation as the union government do effectively get a higher share. Or I'm thinking about swing state that could eventually attract more revenue and and thinking about the, the revenue that are shared without any formula, but also about the instruction that are given by the union government, are they affected or by, by this political affiliation or this has nothing to do with that? Thank you so much. Uh, that's all. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, broader and the general conclusions uh, regarding uh, central state transfers, uh, fiscal transfers to the states in India. Uh, they do not apply to secessionist states because they are dealt with uh, in a different manner. And depending on, you know, they are, uh, they are uh, case by case uh, kind of decisions. And the uh, approach of the union government has not been uniform across the secessionist states. Uh, as far as the parties and federalism thesis is concerned that the uh, own party uh, ruled governments get uh, more uh, financial assistance, uh, that is true if we aggregate the entire data. But again, uh, in case of the secessionist states, uh, for instance, uh, in case of Assam, which is, which is a low income state, and uh, Jammu Kashmir is also low income state. Now, in both these cases, we see that when the secessionist movement began, the government uh, did actually increase the uh, financial appeasement or uh, you can say uh, financial assistance, the magnitude of financial assistance. Was uh, however, at the same time, uh, some of the uh, political concessions were unacceptable uh, in case of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. 
which is seen as more antagonistic uh, in comparison to Assam. In Assam, the secessionists were uh, ultimately uh, co-religionists. They belong to the same religion, although they had different language, they had a uh, different culture, but they are Hindus, the Ahoms. Uh, but in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the problem is also sort of communal. And uh, Pakistan's intervention is also there. And in case of Punjab, uh, because as I told, uh, they had lost their bargaining power because the uh, militancy also lost support among the common people. And uh, no militancy can survive before, uh, without the support of the uh, indigenous people. And also because there was no external support. So therefore, uh, no institutional accommodation uh, is seen in the case of uh, Punjab. So you see, case by case uh, decisions uh, are made. Uh, in case of all the secessionist uh, regions uh, in India. Anything I have left unclarified in this? You're muted, Alice. I, I had lost the screen because I was you writing can, in the chat to, to, again, to Professor I, Dave so Bell. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I could follow everything. I could just find the unmute microphone. Sorry. So thank you very much, Anchal, for your reply. And uh, I have to add something because Professor David Bell wrote to me saying hello to everybody and excusing that he had to go because we are a bit late and for his, again, sorry. But he wanted to say goodbye to everyone, but he just wrote to me. And so, okay. And would like to thank you for this. Uh, fruitful workshop and discussion. And to Chanchal, thank you so much for your answer. Uh, yeah, I think we can close this webinar that has been rather long, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> especially for those in, in the Far East <laughs> that uh, uh, I believe it's quite late now in Australia. So uh, I would like to thank you all for, for being here with us uh, today and for your wonderful and very insightful presentations. Uh, we will keep in touch with you, of course, for the, for the book chapter. And I would also uh, like to remind you of uh, um, this uh, Federal Scholar in Residence program that my colleague uh, Petra Mafertaina uh, posted in chat, a program uh, which uh, allows you to win a three weeks uh, research day here in uh, Botano Bolton in South Tyrol in Northern Italy. Uh, you just need to hand in a paper that can be written in um, up to five languages, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you very much from, from my side, also from uh, Alice for being, uh, being here with us uh, today. We will upload um, these uh, webinars to our YouTube channel, so you could uh, check them out uh, offline if um, you cannot attend all of them. And we will uh, continue tomorrow with our final with our final panel uh, featuring the cases of, of Canada and Spain. It will be at 5 p.m. Central European uh, Eastern Time. And so uh, with this, we will lead to a we will close. And again, thank you very much to the uh, three of you, also to Professor Webb, who had to go, uh, for uh, sharing your insights on this on this very fascinating topic. Thank you, and have a good day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Have a pleasant day. You too. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>